John Top of It podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. My guest today is Slate. Hello. And I am your host, John Meisberg. And today we are going to be talking about the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, or CHOP, as it's more commonly referred to. But um, Elise, thanks for for being on the show. Um, Question for everyone. What do you think CHOP accomplished? Comment below, and we will try to refer to that uh, at the end. And also, show poll... Do you support CHOP? Cast your vote with a reaction and we will uh, tally it up at the end. So first of all, um, what I'd like to talk about is what's up with the outfit? (laughs) So the outfit is as much part of like, there's some like ridiculousness that goes on when you're going into a place that has decided there's no law enforcement anymore. And then the the cops actually left. Uh, You kind of have to follow the strange rules of like artistic direction in my mind, where in order to be iconic, you have to sort of wear the same thing over and over again. You have to have the same look, the same vibe. And so like for me, like the outfit is, is as much as part of like being able to be identifiable and be recognizable uh, as it was, you know, protection. And, you know, we weren't necessarily fearing gun threats the entire time. And in fact, most of the time, like we, it was just kind of like, okay, what are we dealing with? We're mostly dealing with mental health or we're dealing with all these other issues. But uh, it was more about kind of being a character and kind of being able to be instantly recognized. Like, oh, that's the crazy person with the body armor. Like, oh, but they know what they're doing. So we're in a good place. Yeah, but I mean, not to... (laughs) like undersell yourselves like you guys were actively rooting out potential white supremacy threats right well you know the thing that i think is really funny is that people um always kind of go on about how the you know the the white supremacy threat was really like super apparent and super super obvious but like in, in my opinion more often than not it was people being led there by this reporting that was basically saying that you know seattle's burning they've taken control of the city it's a it's a nightmare they're haggling all the businesses they're demanding you know ids for access and like you know that's just wasn't what was happening and so like you know there's no greater way for them to see what's going on than by having them come here and experience them experience it themselves uh, just for them to discover it's kind of cool and there's free food and people are generally respectful if you be respectful and if you're not running around screaming you know uh trump 2020 or whatever just trying to be an instigator then then people were very respectful And and i had quite a few conversations with people that like you know were watching tucker carlson and drove all the way out there just to see it for themselves only to be entirely disappointed that it wasn't what they thought so wait a minute you're telling me you're telling me slate that this person was not there Oh, no, he was there. But <laughs> my favorite part of that is that uh, that guy was, he's basically my number two. Uh, so I had to, I had been dealing with him. Like, then he got all over the national media. And I was like, oh, man, like the first night I was, I was at right next to where they actually took that photo uh, the first night that I was down there. But that's, you know, it was so funny to see him plastered all over the news. And then, you know, we, we had all the memes going around. We were sharing them with everybody, getting it absolute kick out of it because he he does exist he's a real person he's a real person but i made him put the gun away but the the, <laughs> me, the media was definitely kind of exaggerating or trying to create like a certain narrative that this that chop was this crazy scary place yeah and then it gets like going there at least from my perspective when i was down there it's like night and day difference it was not yeah well a, a big part of it is, is it's like you know <clears throat> the first the first day was kind of uh, really chaotic and up in the air. And so, like, there's lots of people making lots of different decisions of, as to, like, what to do. Um, and a lot of these people had didn't have experience. And so, like, you know, they were basically trying to say, like, you know, oh, we don't trust the media. We don't trust such and such. And I'm like, okay, well, you guys realize that that then becomes the story, right? Like, the story then is that you're keeping journalists and such and such out and you're asking for press passes and you're oppressing the media. That then becomes the story. So in order for you to be able to actually control the story, you, you actually have to let them in. 
you actually have to let them experience this this thing for themselves. Otherwise, they they can literally just report whatever is written on the wall. You know. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's just a, it was kind of a a, a weird space to be in because people just didn't. Like the media didn't know what to make of it because they couldn't simplify it in an easy way. And, and admittedly, all of us, we didn't know what the hell was going on either. Yeah. You know, it's not like we had ever asked for this. It, it was just suddenly handed to us. And now we had to deal with the problems. Well, I mean, I wonder, you say that the media didn't know how to handle it. I wonder how much of it is that and how much of it is maybe there's some top down like instruction on how, oh, to, there, how to cover the story. There's absolutely top down in instruction when it yeah. comes to that. Because the, the simple truth of it is, is that like the guys that I talked to on the ground, they knew what the truth was, but by the time it made it to the editing room floor, like, you know, that's somebody a thousand miles away with 1,500 other stories with a thousand other things going on that they're not entirely interested in, in telling a, a version of the truth. There's many truths in the world, as yeah. we've learned. And the truth that you choose to find is entirely based on your experiences. And a lot of these uh, places, they were selling this idea that this place was so scary that, like, in the beginning, it was really nice. It was borderline, you know, a festival, like a street fair almost. Yeah. And then it, through that first weekend, and then because of all this reporting about how it kind of was a scary place, it became regarded as a scary place. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, like, I'm not going to say that, like, it's some big media, you know, uh, conspiracy to, to, to make everybody uh, want to be in, you know, to, to, it's not some big media conspiracy to, like, throw this thing under the bus as much as it was that just, like, that's just what happens is that if you say something's dangerous, it's going to eventually become dangerous. Yeah. I, I loved watching Fox news and hearing what they had to say about it. Actually, a friend of a friend of mine and I, we would turn on Fox news just to watch like Tucker Carlson talk about it. Oh, and we would yeah. die laughing, hearing how they were describing it. And then you go there and it's like community gardening, <laughs> community gardening. <laughs> and like, my favorite thing is that that was still there. Like way after I went back there and they, they had kept it because like, it's still there. It's the still sun, there. The sunflowers so are like the size it. of those trees. No, it's, it's fantastic because like, you know, you go down there and you, you get to experience it. You're expecting terrorists and all this other stuff. You're yeah. expecting everyone's dressed like me. Uh, no, there's just like one or two of us. And then there's like, you know, a, a family of four there helping plant, gar you know, corn for the first time. Like, I'm like, what is going on? This yeah. is such a, it was, <laughs> I say it's the best job I never had because I didn't have the job. Like I just showed up, but you know, sometimes that's, that all, that's all it takes, but just like the, <laughs> It was such a, it was so many things to so many different people and so many different people use it as an opportunity to express so many different things, so many different ways. In my opinion, it's like one of the greatest like little tiny artist collectives that ever happened in Seattle and then just, you know, evaporated when it went away. But for a little while there, it was just a very strange place to be. There was always something going on. So let's, let's just get this down. So formerly, like what was your involvement at shop maybe how did you how did you um get involved in the first place and then and then how did that transition into uh your your current role well basically what happened was is that like i was doing i was covering the the protests at that point and then when i went down there the day after the police left because you know i got a phone call that was just like hey they just left and I was like, what do you mean they just left? Like, no, the cops just packed up everything and are gone now. We have all of Cal Anderson. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And I went down there. And sure enough, like, the the infighting had started that night. There was a whole bunch of infighting. And, like, a Carmen Salant was down there. Um, or I, I always mispronounce her name. But she was down there. Yeah, that's a hard name. Salant was down there. And she basically... Um, was getting into an argument with all these different uh, people that were all trying to talk to her and shout down. And it just turned into this infighting where like I immediately was like, Ooh, we need to get something a little more organized about this. And then like I was looking around and I just noticed that like all of these so-called security people that were there to like help, you know, keep people from getting hit by cars, which was really our biggest threat the whole time was being vehicle strikes. Yeah. Um, Which is something that happened down there. Yeah, it did. Oh, yeah. And, and, it, and it happened twice. And so because that was fresh in everybody's mind, like I was like realizing, like, oh, wow, none of these people know how to build a vehicle gate. None of these people know how to make it so that you can have access to in and out of something while also doing it. So like all of a sudden I realized that like I'm in this strangely unique position to where like I know how to 
build all this little infrastructure with whatever we can find and just be like, all right, well, this is our barricade at 12th and Olive. This is our barricade at uh, 10th and Pike. And, and so I would basically just walk around. And this is literally, I have, <laughs> I brought a GoPro the first day and I was just like, I just, I, I like went through it just to see if I had recorded anything. Cause I don't remember recording anything, but I did find like a 30 minute clip of me just walking around from uh, checkpoint to checkpoint, essentially to, to all the, our security gates and access points. Um, and just, you know, pointing out things that are improvements and just being like, hey, no, I just want to try to get a kinetic stop vehicle barricade built here. So if you guys, uh, you know, if anyone stay in the night, could you guys park your cars in such and such a way? And just it, I realized that, like, that's all it took because, like, I was listening to all the conversations that all the other people were having at the time and no one knew what to do. Everyone was just kind of like sitting in this, this space of like, OK, well, we have this thing and I'm here and I'm helping, but I don't necessarily know how to help the best. And so like a lot of what I was doing was just talking to people and just kind of being like, hey, no, well, maybe we should try this thing. Or, um, you know, we, de- you know, a bunch of Proud Boys show up with guns. What do we do? Um, and, you know, the simple answer they're like, you know, should we try to like escort them out? Should we try to da 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 da? I was like, no, don't give them a target. They're trained the same way I am. They're not going to shoot at somebody who's not a threat. Hopefully. Hopefully. And if they do, well, then, then you have a no Russian situation where like you don't, it doesn't matter because at that point, you, nothing you can do in that situation is going to stop someone from becoming a mass shooter necessarily mm-hmm. other than shoot back. But prior to that, all of these other incidences that could happen, like, you know, having a, sh- a shootout with this random group of Proud Boys, that's completely mitigated by not giving them a target. And so we just didn't give them a target. And then they came back the next day and we didn't give them a target again. And then they got bored and left. And that's that's what it takes. It's sometimes it's about the long con, not necessarily just, you know, oh, I want to look this way. I got to be this way. We have to act this way in the media. We have to do this thing because we're these types of people. No, it's what is actually the solution? How do we get to the solution using the tools that we have? Because we don't have the means to push these people away. All we have to do is the means to make them bored of us. And that's a powerful tool in itself still. Mm-hmm. So we, we just use what we had. What, what I think is fascinating about this whole situation is that everything was uh, improvised in that um, there is no, there's no like company that hired you. No. And then no. there was no like, there's no guy who's like hiring leaders to run CHOP. Like everything was this organic thing where everyone cared enough about, you know, black rights that they all were working together to find where do I best fit in to support this overarching narrative, right? Yeah, it was kind of this strange thing of like, how do I apply myself in a way that's meaningful? Yeah. And I seem to see that like across the board where it was just people like you didn't, we didn't have control over who was showing up. <clears throat> At no point can we say like, oh no, you're not part of security. Because you know why? That guy can just walk around, act, say that he's security and then mace a bunch of people, which he did. Multiple times. Did that happen? Oh, yeah, that oh totally happened. Yeah, we had, we had a guy that was um, being, he was a self-appointed sheriff, as we jokingly called him. And he would run around in this bright orange vest and just bear mace people and tackle people. He, he, he squeezed a round off once while we had 15 cops in a triangle formation, in a flanks formation in front of us. And I'm standing there talking to him. He squeezes a round off in the middle of the park because someone was playing music at 5 in the morning. And it's like, That's guys funny. like that are the literal reason why, like, of course we're going to look bad in the media. Because if they're running, they, they just need to run a camera on him for an hour and he's going to do something stupid. Yeah. And so they did. They just waited around and just like, oh, there he goes. Oh, and he made somebody. And we're off. And so, like, you know, you, you can't actually control any of who's coming in or, or what their intentions are. And so you just kind of have to find a way to balance that. How do we take these people that could have well simultaneously we have to manage the culture of like this is a self-driven place this is a direct action society so if you see something better i want you to do it better but at the same time better doesn't mean you're hiding an ak-47 in an alleyway Mm -hmm. that's been modified illegally to fight be fully automatic and you're waiting with a motorcycle title and a bunch of other stuff like when you find that like that then becomes an I- a whole other issue right because like th- if that's someone's way of like direct action like i'm for it like i'm all for the fact that you care please put your gun away but like i mean you're what you're getting at is you don't want to escalate a situation that could have been de-escalated yeah while simultaneously you need to manage keeping people engaged and involved in a way that feels meaningful for them because that's 
why we're all here. Yeah. Um, it's not my job to turn people away. It's not my job to make someone feel like shit. You know, it's my job to basically make sure that like of the assets that we have, that we're utilizing them in the best way to see a somewhat good outcome, whatever that meant. And what I found was, is that just like in, in time with doing all of this crap, like we, we just found that there's, there's just so many different people with so many different ideas of how to help. So I, I, one of my favorite stories is a guy came up to me one day and we had just closed the alleyway behind the, the precinct because it had been tagged and tagged and tagged. And there was residents that live in that alleyway and they had had enough and I, and I completely understand why. And so I met with them and kind of talked to them They're like, look, can we please close this alleyway so that there aren't 30,000 people in my backyard? And that was something we did for them and something we tried to do for them. And, and we, would, we would station someone there to keep people out of, the, out of the alleyway. And then this guy comes just barging in one day while we're having a meeting. <clears throat> and I go down to talk to him. He's wearing Pierce County Jail uh, pajamas and <laughs> um, is looking at the side of the, the building. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm going to give you guys free power. I'm like, what? You're going to what? He's like, no, man. See, I'm an electrician. I'm going to climb up on the roof. I'm going to tap in. <laughs> I'm going to tap into their, into, their, into their electricity, and I'm going to give it to you guys. This sounds like something out of a movie. It, <laughs> how the hell do you think I felt? I'm sitting there in this strange moment like, is this guy going to go Ocean's Eleven on us and just like jump up on the roof? And Like, what is going on? What? And so how do you manage that? What do you tell a guy that clearly just got out of prison, like yeah. does not give a shit? Yeah. And... <laughs> Or is he even going to listen to you if you tell him don't do it? Exactly. Yeah. He's not going to listen to you if you tell Probably if you tell not. him don't do it. And like I tried, trust me, but he he didn't listen. And so like as a result of him not listening, I was just like, oh okay, I think I'm gonna have to direct him into a way to where he's not directly inflaming the police department by doing this. So it's like okay, well, what if, have you checked the park? Because there's more people in the park. And so like even though I know that this guy is going to go do something dumb. I need to like vent. I need to like push that in a direction that doesn't make the cops swarm us for tapping into the police station and messing with their electronics. Um, so <laughs> you end up in this weird balancing game where you have to pick the lesser of two evils and be like, no, no, you should go tap into the power from the park. And he did. So I, I, I mean, I legitimately don't know how, but I did find him a couple of days later, and apparently he had set up a thing, and then uh, Seattle City Light or the parks somebody showed up and took it down but like yeah he, he actually did tap into it so he he could have very easily like very likely just climbed up on top of the police station and tapped in there if he wanted to wow yeah and that's where you're like okay i have to manage the talent and <laughs> the talent right. of of these people where like these are the, like you know i have a an event coordinator here that's making my my dispatch run solidly we know exactly who's where we know exactly how many people are on ex exactly how many corners we're able to manage it to a point to where i could sit at home and just watch the feed of all of our information being shared with each other. And I knew that the situation was taken care of enough that I could take a nap. But, yeah. you know, once you get it to that point, like, that's that's a directly as a result of, of handing your trust to these other people. But at the same time, you have to be like, please don't kill anyone. Okay, here. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's just, it's I, mildly I said terrifying. please, now I'm going to sleep. <laughs> I said please, and I'm going to bed, and I'd like to wake up without a body, please. Like, yeah. Can we just make that happen? Yeah. And it worked for the first couple of weeks. Um, and then obviously things kind of fell apart, but, and yeah. we're going to talk about that. Um, yeah, we'll get to it, <laughs> but I will say, so from, from viewers perspective out there, I think that something that people think about when they think, oh, you worked in security is that you were protecting these people from other people. But it's interesting to hear how the inner workings of like what you had to do to manage the, the like you said, the talent, the people that were there it's yeah. like helping them protect themselves yeah because you know it, <clears throat> i remember a guy um who thank god I, i'm so glad i don't remember these people's names because that way it's so much less of a security threat um <laughs> i don't remember his name but he's wearing a bright pink shirt and he um he's sitting there and he's watching this guy who's clearly mentally ill and not in a good way and when he's not in a good way you know you don't the thing with, with with mental health is that like the delusions that they are in is their reality. So you can't convince somebody else that their reality isn't real because that's their reality. It's entirely concentric to them. And same is true with, with, with people who don't believe in the same politics as you. But um, essentially what you have to do is you have to work with whatever it is that they're doing. And so this guy is like trying to go up to him and trying to get this guy to stop beating up an empty tent. 
And now you see a guy beating up an empty tent, and now you got a couple hints. He did have a sock on his head, so it was kind of like a free giveaway that something wasn't necessarily all screwed in correctly. Um, but once you see this guy, like you're like, okay, so this guy's not well. But then I have this other guy being like, no, dude, you got to stop that. You got to stop that. Why are you beating that thing up? Blah, 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 blah. And so his intent is good. He wants this guy to stop being violent because he doesn't understand that like, Right now, this guy's got a direction. His mental, his delusions are taking him to only beat up a tent, an empty tent, an empty tent that he slept in the next night. So, like, he's directed right now. We don't need to do anything because he's not harming anybody. He's just beating up a piece of property that's likely one of his. So it's not our concern necessarily to step in in this instance because you step in, you know what he's going to do? He's going to start beating you up like you're a demon that lives mm-hmm. in that tent. Yeah. So, so you're hesitant to get involved. You you need to be balanced in the way that you do that because if you don't balance your the fact that you're like, yes, so we have to do something, but we need to do that in a way that keeps him from hurting people. Well, how do we keep him from hurting people? Encourage him to keep doing what he's doing. And so in this instance, even though, yes, it looks disturbing, the safer option of those two things is actually to encourage him to keep, you know, taking care of the demons that he's beating up. And that's what he told me, that he, you know, I, I took care of all these demons and he's pointing to this thing on the wall. And I'm Good like, work, buddy. <laughs> I'm like, dude, good job. Yeah. Keep it up. You're making my job easier. And yeah. the, this guy looks at me like I'm crazy. Like, what did you just do? Why did you tell him to do that? It's like, watch, he's not going to touch anything else. He's going to keep beating that thing up for the next four hours until he gets tired. And he did. And like, that's the whole thing is like, sometimes you, it's not necessarily about stopping a situation as much as it is about controlling the outcome of that situation. Because you, as someone who wants to intervene and do good, you're trying to do that thing. But at the same time, by doing that, you're actually increasing your risk to both him and yourself, because you're now becoming part of a problem that you're creating a safety problem that wasn't a safety problem beforehand. Mm. So... There's lots of times like that where people were like, oh, well, you know, should we should we escort this guy out? And I'd be like, no, probably not, because he's just going to be back in an hour anyway. Like uh, and, you know, especially with dealing with like mental mental health people. And like there's so much of the mental health crisis as we dealt with was like it was amazing because people would dedicate six to ten hours sometimes just on one one person and they would give it their fucking everything. And like when you saw that versus like how I and like and I've dealt with police in, in the mental health capacity before, they show up, they sign a couple pieces of paper, and then they're like, "All right, well, we did our evaluation. He's coming with us." You know, it's a fifteen minute thing. You got to it takes three hours for them to show up, but by the time they get there, you know, that's what their engagement looks like. And so, like, it was kind of really interesting for us to see, like, okay, what are ways that we can do this better because we have time and we have people. We actually have more resources technically than a lot of police departments do as far as mental health stuff because we can actually do the thing that they can't where we can dedicate the time. Mm-hmm. We can dedicate the energy and the effort. And There's not, no quota. There's no quota. We're, we're not up against the wall. We're not having to go run off to a robbery call because we are the robbery call in everyone's eyes. <laughs> like, yeah. Everyone's like, oh my God, you guys are horrible criminals. And we're like, okay, yeah, but we didn't do anything. So... It's kind of it's kind of weird because we ended up having this strange place where all of a sudden, you know, we are still looked to to be a solution for all these weird problems. But at the same time, like people weren't expecting us to be able to handle all these things. Like the fact that we were able to handle literally like 80 percent of what we were dealing with in the middle of it was all mental health crises, mental health fights, um, a lot of intoxication, things like that. And very few of it was like, oh, man, you know, here comes the here comes the police. Oh, man, here they are. They're, they're scouting around us. Oh, they're messing with. Them. No, that wasn't even it. It was literally just maintaining some semblance of normalcy and, and just being able to treat people in this space like, hey, this guy is like we're now actually running the largest homeless camp in Seattle. So we need to start thinking about it in that way. In Cal Anderson Park or? <laughs> well, at the time, you know, when you have a thousand plus people there, that's the biggest yeah. one in the city. Yeah. And so. And, and it's the most well-patrolled. It's all over the media now. And we've got all these resources in here. So naturally, we're going to get a lot of mental... Uh, we're going to get a lot of homeless... The, the homeless population. And the homeless population is disproportionately, uh, you know, has more mental health issues in it. And it's something in a rate of like one in three or one in two is diagnosably mentally ill. And so 
when you have that increase in population, you're then going to have an increase in, in mental health calls and mental health crises. And so we, that was like all we were dealing with was mental health stuff for a while. And then it started to get to where like, oh, and then the shooting happened. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, okay, now we have to think about all these other things that are coming into play. So it kind of, it, it was already kind of a, a crazy situation because there's so much internal, like different directions. Cause, because like, imagine this, right? You know, you have a thousand different individuals all in a place because they want to do something. But as it turns out, that's a thousand different somethings. And I heard it somewhere online that someone said that like, Chop was like if Twitter was a place. <laughs> oh, God. And well, that makes it sound like hell. <laughs> it, it, you know, it does. But it, it also, in its own special way, kind of was because you couldn't get any direction out of it or any leadership out of it. Like, hey, what are we trying to do on this thing? Uh-huh. And then we'd just be like, um, we'll ask leadership. Leadership. And yeah. you're just like, where? Who's leadership? Like, at, at some point, we're all leadership. Like, so who's going to make a decision? And it just it never never came to fruition. So there's lots of weird little ins and outs there. Well, you say uh, you say that there wasn't leadership. There was a guy there though, Mark that, Anthony. N- no, I actually got to interview him. He was great. But well, there was another guy there. I'm forgetting his name right now. It was like three letters. Like Raz Simone. Yeah. 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 What, how do you spell his name? R A Z. Yeah. So this person. Um, at least in the media, was being talked about like he was running the show. I mean, or or one of the people that was running the show. Like they were talking about it all over the the news. Yeah. But again, this is like there's no there's no company that hired this guy. No. There's, there's no organization. Well, it's just like someone stepping up and being like, I care enough about this, and I and I've earned enough people's trust to listen to me, or like. Or who has, or well, maybe the danger is that maybe it's sometimes who has the louder megaphone. <laughs> well, and that's that's a really common thing. It's I, I don't I don't know what I, I, I want to call it the megaphone effect, but it's it's literally it, it becomes a, a matter of who can address the crowd first. Uh huh. And or, like or be the more the most persuasive or be the most persuasive. And and in this particular instance, like Raz, I met him um before well before the chop happened i met him at one of the earlier protests in bellevue of all places and when i was out there he um really reined this group in and he just started talking in such a way that like he got my attention to where like okay this is a guy i'm willing to listen to and a guy that i'm willing to follow because the way that he talks about it isn't some like us versus them mentality thing he talks about it from a very humanitarian angle now the unfortunate thing of that is is that when it came time to like now we have this chop thing. He he was the one being turned to for answers, right? And he's no more of a leader necessarily than anyone else was. But the thing was, he had the Tesla and the speakers. So when he's leading the march, he's now the warlord, apparently, according yeah. to Fox News. Well, yeah, they were saying. Let's see on Wikipedia, they said they characterizing him as a warlord, policing the area with an AK-47, highlighting interaction where he allegedly assaulted a tagger, and then a video was later released where he was distributing firearms to unknown individuals. So I may or may not have been there for that. <laughs> and this, so, is, I mean, this first, is pre my involvement. Can I, can I, just, so. say, can I just say one thing? Is I find it incredibly interesting that if... Black people have guns. They are terrorists and dangerous. And if white people have guns, they're just exercising their Second Amendment rights. Well, I think I, it's total bullshit. It, well, it, it right? Is. It's total bullshit. And, and and my favorite part of it is that like watching, um, you know, because Raz Simone was essentially kind of just doing what I was doing. He was just kind of like addressing the group and trying to keep everyone together and trying to keep the focus going. And so like, he's kind of in the same place I am. But the thing is that like, just because he's a black guy that got videoed with an AK-47, he's now the warlord. Yeah. When in reality, like more often than not, like if you want any one person to blame about three weeks of shit that happened, you could probably point at me more than anyone else. Because as far as all the like the other stuff that happened, like I'm the person that like really was doing a lot of stuff on the ground. Like he was doing a lot of the higher level, like dealing with the media and talking about the the ideologies and like spending the time with the media. And like, I respect the hell out of that. But like, if you really have a problem with something that happened on the ground, you probably have a problem with something I did. And like, that's the thing that I think is so funny is that like they choose to blame him. Because he looks the part. Because he looks the part. For their narrative. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's because he looks the part and like, you know, what the fuck is this? But like it, it 
at the same time, like he he fits the narrative that they're trying to sell. Mm-hmm. He fits this like the you know there's a there's an uprising and they're arming yeah. themselves and that's how scary, he became the warlord. Yeah, it's it's scary. Black people are coming to your white neighborhoods to destroy your safe communities. Yeah, and, not and to and mention vote, the fact that, Trump. <laughs> well, yeah, and not to mention the fact that like um, you know. Capitol Hill was a black area and has historically been a black area. Correct. And like we pe- people that have just moved to Seattle don't know that apparently, but like yeah, it's historically been a black area. And it yeah, was it's. I mean, it's awful. known as the the LGBT area now. It's known as the gayborhood. But, yeah. You know, but before that, there was yes. something else to it, and and it was because it was. And so historically, this area has a lot of history within, um, you know, the the local black culture, and so like when we forget that and we forget that these places actually matter and like East Precinct is a place where like tons and tons and tons of people have been personally, you know, like had had been oppressed there. Mm-hmm. And so like a lot of people had a lot of personal grudges with it, myself included. So like it was really interesting because like once you get into this organizational point to where now we have this thing and we're being reviewed and regarded in this way, even though we didn't create this thing, this thing was sort of created for us. And now we're just kind of like holding on to the shit in our hands. Um, but we we still have it. We still have to do something with it, you know. Yeah. We we this still has to go somewhere. And so the fact that he was turned to and painted as like the warlord is really kind of uh, it was totally fitting of of some sort of narrative that like is higher level. But like for us, it's like okay, well that really muddles the message because this the the space itself was really just a place to learn. Yeah. In the in the first in the first three or four days, it was nothing but just like a, a place to learn. Yeah, I do think it's interesting that it's like, in one way, uh, it's better to be for leadership to be decentralized, so you can't cut off a head and kill the movement. But at the same time, someone has to be uh, making decisions and coming to conclusions that can be disseminated amongst a group so that you can accomplish a goal as a collective. And it's like trying to strike a balance between both, you know, both concepts. That's where we really failed. Yeah. I'd say. So how do you, how do you fix that though? How do you do that better? The the issue is that you have to have the, the issue is that the, the pool of people that was coming together to support this thing all had very different beliefs and we're all there for slightly different reasons. Uh So for me personally, I'm there because I want police reform. I want more accountability. I want more of these things. And that as a byproduct does, and that doesn't make me necessarily a BLM member or an affiliate um, and not to down say anything that they've done, but like when another organization moves in, because like essentially a big thing with the chop was, and this is something I did want to try to remember is that like, the reason the chop existed in the first place is because the neighborhood accepted us and because the neighborhood was like, hey, we really want like, you know, the, the cops have been mistreating us. They've been gassing us every night. Like we're out here supporting all the protesters because like, you know, you'd see businesses like with supplies out front, just handing food out to protesters and all this stuff. Like you saw this kind of outpouring that only the neighborhood was capable of. And then what happened was, is that like once that happened, my attention then turned back to like, how do we maintain the support of the neighborhood? Because if we can hold on to the support of the neighborhood, we could be here for a while. Because if if the neighborhood doesn't want it and the neighborhood views it as a as a good thing, and if we do this in a right way where we can scale this back, because on top of that, like we're at the end of a quarantine. And we're at the end of a quarantine, your occupied protest, even if you time if you time it right and you get it right at the opening of all the businesses in the area. It's like you've been there for three and a half months already because all the business has already shut down. They're already inconvenienced. Yeah. You've already, the gun is already held to their head and all you need to do is just be the person holding the gun at that particular moment to be able to make the demands that you want to make to get what it is that you want. The problem was is that a collective of people, myself sort of included, I didn't really sign off on it. I was kind of a secondary person to just kind of go over the plan. But when they put the blocks in, they put all these concrete blocks in around the area, that's what created the division because a whole group of people understood that like we need to maintain our relationship with the neighborhood because if we don't maintain the relationship with the neighborhood, we then become outsiders invading a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But if we're enacting the will of the neighborhood and we're listening and respecting the neighborhood and letting the neighborhood act and function like a neighborhood again, and doing what the police couldn't do in that particular instance, which is give them a sense of normality without gassing them. So when you then say then we become a fixture of the community. When you say concrete blocks, do you mean 
what they put around the precinct? Are you talking about stuff like this? That, yes. Okay. That is going to be the one. Okay. So you feel like the... So first of all, how did these get here? Uh, they got it there as part of an agreement. Like, So we had been talking with Seattle um, DOT and Seattle City Light um, and Seattle Public Utilities. Or not, not Seattle City Light. Uh, well, Seattle City Light was there occasionally, but it was mostly uh, Seattle Public Utilities and the Parks Department. And so between those three, like I'd have meetings with them pretty much every morning, just kind of seeing like, hey, you know, just giving you guys an update. This is where things are right now. And just kind of like, and, and, I, and, and you know, it, it was just things like that to where like we, we actually did open lines of communication with the city. And so we were actually in a really unique place to where we were working with the city. We occasionally did have to work with law enforcement on higher level crimes, and we would do that. And, you know, like if you, when we found the full auto illegally modified AK, like that had to go to the ATF because otherwise we're obstructing federally. And that's a problem. And that's a crime we can go to jail for. So we don't want that. So we basically ended up having in this strange balancing act where we're trying to figure out exactly how to just keep things going forward. And like, so the city wants us to be able, wants to be able to have garbage service and fire service to these two buildings. And what ends up happening is there's actually a gas leak one day in one of the buildings and the fire department didn't have a way to get in. And so we had to actually come up with a plan to enable them to get in, to be able to respond to an emergency if something does happen. And so that started our lines of communication with Seattle fire department. So then we got to know Chief Scroggins really well and talked to him a lot and, and dealing with all these different people from the city. And so we were actually in a, a very unique situation where we could have actually, there, there was a plausible way for us to have integrated that within part of the systems because we were already working with, because like, you know, in my mind, there's a, there's a few, there's a bunch of things people don't think about when it comes time to disaster. Right. And, I, and I'm a disaster relief professional. So like, or am a disaster relief professional, but like there's a couple things that people don't think about and it's garbage, it's food, it's water, it's shelter, and it's hope. And so like we can't run our own garbage service and we need to be able to manage that. So like that was one of my first priorities. I was like, oh, wait, we got to go talk to the, whoever is going to give us garbage. And so we started talking to Seattle Public Utilities and they started dropping us, you know, dumpsters and, and places and they would come by and they gave us uh, porta potties and all these other things. So we, we actually got a lot of infrastructure from the city. Yeah. You know, something that I think about, though, is it seemed like the city wanted to shut this down sooner than later. Why would they give you all the resources to help you continue? That's strange to me. It's, that's part of it that's also very strange to They're me. They're like, we don't want you there, but also we don't want you shitting on the floor. Well, <laughs> I think the thing is that they didn't want to have to clean it up any worse than it was going to be. Uh-huh. And I think that's, you know, that's a, that's, that's a safe bet, honestly. Yeah. And it's a good way to build rapport with, I mean, I still look, look positively upon all the people that helped us. Because even though they don't necessarily have to agree with us politically, it's the fact that they chose to help us and chose to to help humans being humans, despite the fact that they might not agree with us and that we're making their that we were making their jobs a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And because we were making their jobs a lot harder, like naturally they want to have, you know, they want us to be able to. They want the rest. They want. They don't. I think the big thing is they also didn't want the neighborhood to feel abandoned. And so that was, that's also the other thing that we tried to do is we really tried to make it possible for them to run their garbage. And so like, we'd like, you know, let the trucks in at a certain time and they'd go around and, you know, there's always all sorts of interesting issues when someone who is mentally ill is like, oh man, I, so someone must have thrown my stuff away. And it's like, no, your stuff is over there. Like, no, no, my, someone, someone threw their own stuff away and they're jumping into a garbage truck. Like that then becomes a unique problem. And I'm sure that truck driver has not had to deal with that since or before, but like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I did have to body check a five foot woman, a five foot almost naked woman into a window so that she wouldn't jump into the back of the, the, the garbage truck. But like Wait, why are they jumping in the garbage? Oh, they, to try to get their stuff. They back. think that their stuff's in there. Oh, so they're digging yeah. through it like they're trying to dig through these bags of garbage and we're just like, Okay, can we <laughs> can we let him finish getting garbage? Because like and this that, is a big deal to and, the city. And like, that's the one clip that Tucker Carlson shows on Fox oh, News God, to describe yeah. Chop. It's like And then he photoshops in a guy with a gun. Naked so then, woman like, jumps in dumpster to find her AK forty seven. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> at Chop. Yeah. <laughs> no, and and I just remember like all the stuff like seeing the, the I remember watching Tucker Carlson one night just just for shits and giggles. Yeah. And um 
pull it up and there's a guy walking around with an AK and there's a, a mentally ill man and another mentally ill man and another mentally ill man. It's like, do you think that this is just a colony of mentally ill people that can somehow self-sustain this entire thing without the whole thing fall, fall, falling in on itself? Or are you just trying to fear monger to your, to your audience? Yeah. Oh, it's the second one. Of course. Yeah. Of course it is. So, so. Um, here's something that I thought would be interesting for us to do is yeah. I have the um, timeline of CHOP up on Wikipedia and I thought what we could do is go through like that timeline and maybe yeah. from your perspective you could share anything that you saw from your perspective that was that would be worth sharing yeah. or maybe something that you feel like no. the media uh, did not describe accurately yeah or, yeah and I, I know you said that you know you were um, in you were there to witness um, some of the things that happen, like um, that, I would just say, are worth sharing. So let's yeah. let's get into it. So, uh, um, where where do we begin? Uh, so, so for the viewers out there uh, that have been not really following this too closely, I'll just start at the beginning. So it uh, it says protests over the killing killing of George Floyd and police brutality began in Seattle on May twenty ninth, two thousand twenty. For nine consecutive days, there were street clashes in greater Seattle involving protesters, the SPD, Washington State Patrol, and Washington National Guard. So I remember seeing this um, happening live, and this was in downtown Seattle, like closer to like Pike Place Market area. And this yeah. is like before it ended up in Capitol Hill. I remember it seeming a lot more violent at least the way the media portrayed it it was like well i i will say that like i i've been at the protests since day one like even the the night of protests yeah following i remember them. seeing you down there yeah over facebook and so like i would be um i'd be down there and and you would just see these um you know it was just I remember the the Saturday when we went down and it was it had officially kicked off. Like there was like we were driving through an hour before it started and you could just feel in the air something was wrong. Like there was a an absolute tension in the air that was palpable. You could cut it with a knife, you could shape it into your favorite nearest, you know, jack o' lantern thing. Like you could make a jack o' lantern out of the tension that day. It was so palpable. And so like the the protests that's the 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 kicked off it started allegedly because SPD started firing tear gas canisters at a crowd that hadn't even fully assembled yet. Um, how true that is, I don't necessarily know because I wasn't there. I'm not going to reaffirm something that I didn't see for myself. But like, what I do know is that by the time I got down there at 340, there was a car on fire. They were breaking into the Old Navy. There was uh, SPD only had control of in total two square blocks of the entire city. So they did not have control over that situation. And so that first weekend really kind of set the tone for what happened through the next week where like, yeah, it started downtown. It started in the downtown core. And then the next day, which I thought was really sweet, is a bunch of people, myself included, like went out and just cleaned everything up with grease and like elbow grease and whatever cleaning products we could find. Everyone just kind of went down there and started cleaning graffiti off of stuff. And that was really special, too, because, like, a lot of the people that I talked to that morning were people that were there. And so, like, it, it started to become this stranger, greater, bigger thing pretty much immediately. Um, One of the things that I remember is Seattle is a pretty progressive place in the first place. Uh, in the first place. And when it comes to protests, it seems like everyone comes out, not just, like, your, like, typical, like what you think a protester looks like person and like you would see children in the streets yeah. with their parents going like, yeah, black lives matter. I was like, this is awesome. It's this great. Is awesome. But and also, then, like, but yeah. then this happened Yeah, where this made national news. This was like one of the biggest stories is, you know, they, they ended up macing this little girl in the yeah. face and people got really upset about this. Like Officer really upset. Campbell. Like, like obviously you shouldn't mace people. Officer Unless they Campbell. really deserve it, but like, I think that there's something about macing a child that I think is just a little extra shitty. And 
you know, then you would hear online, I'll never forget having this debate with some of my friends. I had some people say, well, they shouldn't have brought her there. It's her, it's the parents' fault. I'm like, is it? Or is it the police's fault for, for macing the child? And then you get into that stupid argument. Well, but I, but I, yeah, go ahead. And like, I, I think it's really interesting because that particular incident, it highlights just some of the beginnings of, of the moral questions that can be asked. And, and, and it just, it's one of the many ways that you can, you can subdivide, like, in my life, I was always taught to to stand by what you what you believe in, and I was taught that at a very young age. And so, like, if if that's a if that's something that, and, and I was taught that, and I was taught to 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 listen to that instinct from a super super early age, because without your ability to like go out and and like and so like I've had my own ideology since I was like ten or eleven. I used to call into radio shows and go off about politics, and they'd be like, "How old are you?" I'm like I'm 11. They're like, "What do you know?" I'm, I'm like, 11. "I'm paying attention and I'm pissed." And like that's that's kind of the thing that. It's like so if you have this young young person that's out there that's that's what if that person does believe in something? And then you just but then, and then like on top of the fact that like what their opinion shouldn't matter because they're younger. Yeah. What kind of example are we setting like, for how are we posterity? Setting, what type of example are we setting for our kids? Yeah. And, and so like in reality it's like if if this kid's out there and like regardless of the fact it comes down to the use of force used by, in this particular incident, Officer Campbell, um, <laughs> um, basically Being ex- excessive, right? Yeah, because the thing is, it's like you control. Like, it's not like you spray that thing and it's stuck on. You know, it's not like a gun where you pull the trigger and one projectile is going out, and that's 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 done. Like, you can't control that now. It's gone. No, you literally can just turn it off. You don't have to keep spraying the mace. Mm-hmm. No, nothing tells you that you have to hold that button down. Yeah. And so the fact that he, he sprayed a kid is like, that's your fault. Regardless of, of what the cause, rhyme, reason for them being there is, you sprayed a kid. So after that weekend, 14,000 complaints were filed against Seattle police, and 11,000 of them were related to that video. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I had a Jesus. very fun conversation with the... Uh, <laughs> The detective from the uh, Office of Professional Accountability. Um, wow. And he was like, yeah, we got 11,000 of those done all at once. So it was kind of handy, but it was a real pain to go through them all. And like, imagine being that guy. You know, he's like he's like one of the guys that literally his whole job is to investigate whether or not cops have done a bad job. And now his job has just been made 11,000 times harder. Yeah, <laughs> so. for real. So, um Continuing on with going through this timeline, yeah. uh, in the beginning of June, so these protests, they began, and it says that tear gas, flashbangs, pepper spray were repeatedly used by police in these densely populated residential neighborhoods. Um, on June 5th, the mayor issued a ban on tear gas, a 30-day <laughs> ban, and it was kind yeah. of like, you know, we... they said she said that she issued a ban, but from my understanding everything that I heard from my friends who were down there, it was total bullshit that they were still so using tear gas. What is they that... did is is they changed the compound of the chemical agent they were using. Okay. So they went from using CS gas, which is what they had been using and what they shot me with um, when I was down there. Oh, so you were tear gassed? I was tear gassed multiple times. Oh my God. Yeah. I was tear gassed multiple times. I was hit with pepper balls and then shot with a CS round. What is all that like? Uh, it sucks. Yeah. In like a, a layman's term, like if you were to like imagine getting um, like, so the thing with tear gas is that like it's it's a powder, it's a very fine powder, and so um, one of my trainers years ago said that like if you don't want to like when you're dealing with tear gas and you don't have eye pro, the way to deal with it is to blink relatively quickly because it helps cycle that fine powder off your eyes in a way that keeps it from really building up, and so it kind of builds up at the edges of your eyes. Just the thing is, you can't touch it. And I fucked up and I touched it. So oh. I touched my eyes uh, and then I couldn't see. And then because I couldn't see, I couldn't see what the cops were doing. And because of that was going on, like, and then I was tangled in all my camera equipment. And so I go to reach up for my camera equipment and I got shot in the chest with a 40 millimeter uh, less lethal round. So the mayor saying uh, that they are banning tear gas, it was mainly just to appease all of the complaints that came in but there really wasn't an actual ban in the sense that 
they just changed the ingredients so that they could say technically yeah. they changed it so or from a media standpoint yeah well technically they did ban tear gas they did they did stop using cs gas yay good job guys your workaround of of deciding that like uh oh wait you could we could just use oc spray uh, we're just gonna use oc grenades instead that's what they did they just switched to oc grenades what what is that? So it's um, ca ca capsaicin. So same okay. thing as in mace. Uh -huh. um, they're two different compounds that have a fairly similar kind effect. of effect. Uh, they both suck. Uh -huh. um, whereas like OC is more of a physical. Yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah. It's a different compound essentially. Basically, what they did is they just switched grenade types. Now, I guess devil's advocate, if I were to play that, mm -hmm. they need police need to be able to have something that they can use if it's necessary. Not saying any of the actions that they took were necessary, but I do think they need to be able to do something if and if the situation warrants it. But um, I think what's, you know some of the biggest complaints about what had, what had been going on in this area is that they were constantly escalating the situation and using force when it didn't need to be used, right? And, and you know, a big part of a big part of using less lethal ammunition and less lethal tools is that, like, when you're using them, you need to be able to have their efficacy maintained. So, if you're tear gassing a group of people over and over and over again, and they get used to it, they develop techniques to counteract it. They begin to make your less lethal armament less effective the solution is either you have to change your tactics as to how you use that thing or just keep doing the same thing. And their solution really was just keep doing the same thing. They would yeah. just keep throwing tear gas grenades. And like, you'd see like, because it's like they didn't have to worry about any uh, consequences of what they were doing. Well, the the biggest difference that I got in in this time of of uncertainty that it, that was really stuck out with me it was was my time covering the um, riot essentially in in Bellevue, because Bellevue PD reacted in an entirely different way than Seattle PD did. They only deployed, I think, in total three or four tear gas canisters for the entire couple hours that I was there. Like they only deployed three or four in the first when the first big group. And then they deployed maybe eight or ten at the end. Like the amount of gas used comparatively uh. was so much less because they knew how to keep the tool effective. And so the thing is, is that but when you continuous when you build uh, an expected threat profile against you, you allow your your whoever your your uh, your antagonist to to develop techniques and strategies to deal with your tools, you have weakened yourself by doing so. And so like, that's kind of the concern with like being SPD. Like I remember the last day and watching just how fearless people were as SPD uh, approached, they didn't give a shit. They had umbrellas, they had face masks, they had uh, respirators, they had um, gas masks, they had everything that they needed to be able to counteract every single one of their tools. And as an officer, what do you do then when the only, the only thing that gets these people to run is when you start shooting? Yeah. How bad of a situation have you created for yourself by letting it get to that point? And so, like, they just kept using it over and over and over again. They just keep dumping, you know, CS grenades, CS grenades, CS grenades, CS grenades. And we would just, and you'd see people there with a leaf blower blowing it the other way, and then another guy would kick it. And then they'd have to throw another one. <laughs> and they'd just keep doing that. And so that's why the whole neighborhood got gassed out was because the protesters were making them use more and more and more and more and more of these tools that they didn't, that were becoming less and less and less effective. And so now they're at this strange point to where like the only thing, like if you were a troublemaker, they'd hit you with a, uh, with a, with a foam round comes out of a 40, 40 millimeter grenade. It hits like hell. Um, but that's what they've been using as, as a way to now increase the thing. But like, it's, it's a less lethal round. It is technically quote unquote a rubber bullet. And so when now they're using all these, now they have to start graduating to using more direct contact uh, techniques rather than area denial, which is what um, CS gas is. It's designed to deny access to an area because you don't have the appropriate gear. But the thing is, if you have the appropriate gear, it's no longer area denial. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> but that's, it is kind of like... It is a pain in the ass, but... <laughs> Yeah, but it, I mean, it does kind of make it so less people feel like they can participate and exercise their First Amendment right. 
oh, to totally. freedom of speech yeah, because absolutely. you're like, I can't be there if I don't have the right equipment to be there. Yeah. And, and, right to assembly. And that's the, that's kind of the, the crazy thing is that like, I, I think about just how much money I spent on a shit to, to be able to deal with a lot of the situations I was dealing with in the shop. And like, I easily spent over a thousand dollars just on personal pr- protective equipment yeah. just for myself, like gas, you know, facial, like respirators, um, um, eyewear, headwear, just everything. Like, you, you know, you end up making these crazy investments just to be able to, to voice your first amendment. Right. And like, what kind of upside down are we living in? Yeah. I didn't see this episode of, 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 uh, of great, of stranger things. <laughs> yeah. It definitely doesn't feel like it should be necessary to have to buy a bunch of equipment to, you know, stand up for the rights of black people. I think that, you know, it's really, um, really wrong. Well, it's, it's telling. Yeah. It's very telling as to where our priorities are. Like, are we more prioritizing other people's ability to voice their, because the other thing is it's like, because of this strange way that like our society has been shifting in the last, I'd say 20 to 30 years, we have this strange notion of like, oh, these people are doing this thing, but I don't see, I don't understand their perspective, so clearly what they're saying is wrong. Like, when you're, when, like, I am of a marginalized group, I'm queer, but, like, I have some control over that, right? And I, and I listen to the people in that community that tell me, like, hey, this is how that thing feels when, you, when these things are going on. And so when that happens to the black community, all of a sudden, all these white people are standing around saying like, oh, well, you know, like, I don't see that happening all the time. So, like, it's clearly not and like, no, because you don't have the perspective to be able to understand the situation in the first place. Mm-hmm. And that's the important thing is that, like, there is a time and a place to sit down and shut up and listen and listen. And that's the thing I think has really changed this year more than any of the other attempts is that, like, people are finally listening. Yeah. And how far that carries us, we have yet to see. But hopefully it, it takes us in a positive direction. Hopefully this all means something. Yeah. So. Well, and that's something I wanted to talk about with you later is what what you think is the result of all of this has been. But um. Yeah. Let's. But to continue with this, this this timeline. Yeah. Um, let's see. June, on June sixth, it says city, county, and state representatives join the demonstrators on the front lines. Mm-hmm. Um. I imagine Durkin was not there. <laughs> Durkin was not there. Durkin was not there. Um, um, and it says that flashbangs and pepper spray were still used on the crowd mm-hmm. at that point. I'll never forget seeing this one shot. I wonder if I can pull it up. But it was um, like a news reporter had like a tear gas container like like hit her or something while she was while she was on air or something. Yeah, um, in, in like the soccer field area. That sounds perfect. That sounds just like them. Um, here we go. Emma, oh, here it is right here. Here it is. Let me see this. Let's see. They had the clip. Uh, let's see. Oh, this stupid guy. This Tucker Carlson's face. Oh um, boy. <laughs> MS yeah, it was an MSN Who was it? Do you remember? Did it say? Uh oh, maybe this is not it. It's I mean it's fine. Basically there's this crazy clip where like a a reporter got hit in the face with like tear gas canister, but um so after this, there was a uh, situation where a man drove his vehicle into the protesters and shot shot someone. And I actually have I have a clip of that. So let's see. Yeah. There's this car that showed up, like drove in. Yeah. So and everyone you. So and this is what happened is he actually you can't see it, but he drove around. Um, that's Eleventh Avenue right there. It's Eleventh and um, Pine, I believe. 
Um, he drove around 11th and Pike at high rate of speed, sped up into the thing, hit a barricade that they had hastily set up. And this is where like the barricade thing came from. This is why we then got something called the barricade brigade started where like it was just people that were building barricades to keep cars out. And it was because of this exact threat. This guy literally runs in. Uh, if you go back, you can kind of see where everyone starts running. Oh, here we go. This will actually show it. Oh, maybe it won't. No, but there's a... There's a second you see in the video where everyone just starts running. And it's because here he comes. Yeah, so he came up around the corner, hits this thing. Everyone gets all pissed because, dude, what are you doing? And then he whips out, pulls a gun out, and shoots and the guy And shoots the guy, right guy right who was gr- r- yeah. pulling him out of the car. Yeah. I see. I wonder I wonder what the what this guy's uh, case is right now with law enforcement. If, I'm, if he's going to get off for, like, quote-unquote self-defense for being pulled out of his car or not. You know, as as someone who's worked in with enough scumbag lawyers and He's probably every, gonna... every, like, I love, like, lawyers can be wonderful people and they're great, but all of them are scumbags at some point. So, like, his scumbag lawyer is probably something like saying, you know, hey, there's, um, you know, he was, he was in fear for his life and he didn't know as to whether or not he would well, be ripped to shreds by this mob of people. But why did he drive down exercised. there? Because he's a moron. Because he's trying to instigate. He's, his uh, his uh, brother or cousin or somebody like that works for SPD. Yeah, so he is going to claim that... He's going to claim that he made a wrong turn. Yeah. And then and accidentally drove down this road. And then... But what, the, 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 what people are purporting as the truth is that he did this to incite a a panic and to scare people well, and he's what i call an instig an instig is an instigator anyone can be an instig like you can have someone be useful one day and then they could be an instigator the next day mm-hmm. so like the and they come from both sides they they're it's it's irrespective i try to make it irrespective of political leanings or anything like that because anyone can be an instig i can have the most left-leaning instig try to tap into power uh on the roof of the police station or i can have another instig rock, walking around screaming trump 2020 trying to piss everybody off now, you can do both of those things, but you're still the same type of problem for me. And then you're an instigator. And really what he was trying to do is he was trying to instigate something to happen and or to instigate and, and instill a certain sense of fear. And he accomplished that because everyone was now looking over their shoulders for the first time. And, like, that's a new thing for some people, you know? So this, here, I, by the way, I found the clip that I oh, wanted yeah. to show you. Oh, <laughs> I got it. I mean, you've probably seen it, but I got to play it again. This is like memory lane. Look at this. She's, she's on live with MSNBC, 919 at night. And what's this? Caca! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yep. That's some great A reporting right there. No, yeah. I um, I remember seeing that. What, I mean, like, holy shit. There? I used to live there. I used to live on 12th and Olive, like yeah. right there. I'm like, this is a war zone. Yeah. No, like literally, literally, this is this is like blocks away from my old my old apartment. Yeah, but I, I just can't believe that they they were indiscriminately doing things to protesters, regardless if you were there to protect people, to report on what was yeah, happening. Yeah, they, they don't. They didn't care, care if you were a medic, if you were a reporter. You're still at risk of being attacked. Well, it's because the freedoms of this country have just been apparently whittled away to nothingness from for media protections. And that's that's actually the that was kind of the the running joke I had is that like we our whole job at the chop is to treat the media better than the cops do, and we did. <laughs> the re- so um, someone in the comments actually just uh, let me know that the reporter that got hit was Joe Ling Kent. Joe Ling Kent, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Benji, um, for that. Yeah, I've seen her around. Uh, She'd been around a couple times, but like th- at that point, like you know, I think she was kind of like, I think I'm gonna leave because I didn't see her after that. Yeah. Okay. So on, let's see. On June seventh, the SPD reported that the crowd was throwing rocks, bottles, fireworks, and shining green lasers into officers' eyes. Um, I, um. I remember seeing, I remember going down there and seeing they were above on top yeah, of buildings. They were on top of the rich. They had building. lasers shining at people. Yeah. I think they were trying to identify bad actors from their perspectives well, to like point them out for other to people. To other people, yeah. For other police to go get them or, but well, it, it I was, don't know. It was, uh, you know, at that point, like it had settled into a pissing match. Uh-huh. 
It's it's a bunch <laughs> of like he said, she said, or like or like no, I didn't do it, you did it. Like, yeah, I didn't do it, you did it, yeah. and then like you know, I remember I was there the night of the. I don't remember. I was there a couple nights where it kicked off, and like every time it kicked off, it seemed to be like it was one side or the other. Like whose fault was it this time? And like mm-hmm. oh. On Tuesday, it was our fault. On Thursday, it was their fault. On Friday, they left. You know, so like it was it was a day by day thing of like, huh, who's gonna fuck up tonight? And like it seemed like everyone was just turning up to find out who it was. But it, it was it was really interesting to to see this like this is what created it was this community this this coming together that created what ended up becoming the, the Chaz and then the Chop. Um. You know, something because everyone got to know each other at this point. Because when you spend ten hours standing in a sweaty box during a global pandemic, when you're not really supposed to be standing in a giant sweat pole um, with a thousand other people, um, because you actually give a shit about what's going on in your country, uh, when you when you do that, and you you end up making friends, and so like all these people were now starting to come for each other, and so you've actually you've accidentally galvanized the entire city against you. Like anyone that's showing up to these protests, they care more than a lot of the other people do. And like, you don't necessarily get to know that because they've already made the connections. They're, they're now fighting for each other in the same way the police are now fighting for each other, except it's personal. And you know, it's not a job. They can go home. Like, the, the cops can go home. They can quit their jobs. But like for a lot of these people, you can't quit being black. Yeah. That's the whole argument against, uh, do black lives matter, blue lives matter? Like blue lives matter is an occupation. It's not your race. You could take off the I'm suit. Gonna you can't say take this. off your skin. Like I'm going to straight up say this as someone who used to wear a uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Blue lives don't exist. You, you, Cause as soon as you take that uniform off and you put your hair into a ponytail and then you skip down the street, no one fucking knows you're a cop anymore. But you can't take off being black. No, you super can't take <laughs> off being black. Like I, we watched Michael Jackson try, but yeah. we know where that yeah. went. So, so, Something interesting to note about the lasers, something yeah. that I think about is uh, the person who filmed the footage we showed you guys earlier where the child was pepper sprayed at the protest. That person was later arrested weeks later and they claimed that he was shining a laser at, at in, the helicopters at something. Yeah, he yeah. was using a laser and then he comes out and he's like, the only laser I've ever seen is a laser hair remover <laughs> is that he doesn't even own a laser. And so I thought it was kind of interesting that um, it started to feel like if you filmed, if you filmed at CHOP and you put the police in a bad light, that there could possibly be negative consequences. And I f- it just feels so... Um, anti-american to me or that we would feel like we're not able to document you know not a, even slant what's happening but document what's happening with our own eyes yeah. and show it to the world that we could somehow receive um a backlash targeted, for that targeted, just for showing what they're doing yeah not even like trying to put it in adobe after effects and manipulating it to make them yeah. look bad all i'm doing is like if someone films it it's like you you maced this girl she didn't she clearly didn't deserve it i showed the world and now i'm being arrested and you're and from i can't say 100 percent this is true but it sounds like he was accused the laser thing was an accusation that is baseless. So I don't know. I mean, I, I can't speak to that, but it seems like it is according to what he's claiming that he doesn't even own one. Well, and, and that's I like a, know. it's an, it's not an uncommon thing. And, and that's, that's a big part of the reason why, like when, when we would leave the chop, like we'd have to run, we had our own routes. Everyone had their own route to shake tails and whether or not that worked is a whole other thing. But like everyone I knew that was down there and that would had to, had to leave, like everyone I, I gave, I would start giving people routes like, hey, go through this thing, do this loop in this way. You'll know if someone's following you because they'll do this, 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 this or this. And like because the, the harassment wasn't ever something based off of anything we would have ever done there. And that's the reason why I'm still paranoid about my, my identity to this day is because if they can, you know, they, they can extrapolate anything from any of the number of actions that happened down there. And they can say that you've committed such and such of a crime, but they don't need to prove that you have committed the crime to severely ruin your life mm-hmm. because they can arrest you beforehand on those charges and keep you in custody until those charges are filed. 
and then they can file those charges, make you bail out, then have to go through this whole, and then do it the fuck again for anything else afterwards. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to be true for them to punish you. You don't have to go to jail to have your life be ruined by cops. Yeah. Well, that's, 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 (laughs) that's wrong. And it's unfortunate, but I do believe that is, it is our responsibility as Americans to continue speaking up about injustices and trying to, recognize the opportunities for improvement throughout our country, including law enforcement, to just make this a better and um, inclusive and equal place for everyone that lives here. And I think that as long as you are, that's like where you're coming from, then I, I think you can sleep at night and not uh, feel like you've done something that, I don't know, I feel like it's important to do that and that if you, I'm, I am concerned about living in a country where people are afraid to speak up. You know, that's scary to me that we are being shown situations that kind of tell you implicitly if you say something about what you see that is wrong, that that could somehow get you in trouble. But if it's the right thing to do to say something, I feel like you you need to, you know. Well, I said, and I and I still say this a lot when I, when I'm talking about whatever happened in the shop is that like, I didn't decide to go down there to become this person. Uh huh. I this is this is a coping mechanism for the fact that I was down there, and I just now realized that people want to know who I am because I'm I'm starting to answer their questions, and so like, so much of like the the chaos and oh god i just completely lost my train of thought. what were you just talking about <laughs> well <laughs> sorry this all uh this this entire conversation stemmed from talking about the the use of of the spd was reporting that the crowd was throwing rocks bottles fireworks yeah. and shining green lasers into the officer's eyes um which then resulted in tear gas being used yeah again, which well, we're gonna get into and, and and basically like to try to tie something back into this uh <laughs> Essentially, like the, the the escalation that SPD would say, like you know, they were throwing incendiary devices. They threw a candle. Um, you yeah, know. I remember that. I remember them saying it was an incendiary device, which makes it, me think about like a bomb or something. Yeah, well, an incendiary device would be you know something of along the lines of say like a you know Molotov cocktail. Uh-huh. That's an incendiary device. It is a, it is a device that creates more fire. <laughs> but incendiary device sounds a lot scarier. Well, yeah, it's part of the media management because th- uh-huh. that's the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that like SPD still has to manage their PR to some degree, right? They're like, oh crap, we just uh ooh um hey uh so we just maced a bunch of people and uh, we <laughs> need to find 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 the sharpest things on the ground right now and take pictures of them and like. I get it, <laughs> you know. I respect. I respect the fact that like you got to do that, that kind of uh, CYA. Go. Yeah, here we Seattle go. Seattle police literally tried to play off a candle as an incendiary device, which they tried to use as justification for trying to move the protesters away from the precinct and onto the I five to march to Northgate. You couldn't even be bothered to take the label that clearly says "candle" off before you posted it, claiming it was an explosive. <laughs> I mean, what I don't I don't know what a candle could do. I guess it could technically set something on fire. I, I mean, it is by definition an incendiary device. Yeah, it's just because term- it does contain incendiary means. Aka, yes. you could burn yourself on that candle. I guess. Careful, OSHA is coming. Um, no, I just think it's 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 goofy because like the the just the amount of like micromanagement they were doing to try to like spin this narrative one way or the other is it was unremarkably the same. Like, of course they're doing this. You it, know? It's, it was not surprising at all. It's just kind of funny to, it's like a terrorist act from the Yankee Candle store. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Updated news. I wonder what we've it's... We've found out yeah. inside. So, we've got candles. Yeah, it's well, like the soup thing. Soup for my family. Uh-huh. That's like my favorite new, like, Antifa meme. And I, I like to say Antifa because that's not how you say it, but that's what Fox News says. Um... So the, the these Antifa, um, they uh, they're carrying soup now, and like you know, at the, it's just like the candles beforehand, and then it was like the umbrella thing, and then it was like. So for people out there that don't know what soup for my family is, can you explain that? <laughs> so President Trump was making a claim the other day that 
Um, Antifa were walking around with their groceries in their bags trying to go home and that they were all protesters despite the fact that they had grocery bags because they would take the soup out and throw it at people, but then if they didn't need to throw it, then they would just say it's soup for my family if they were caught. And it's like, dude, come on. We, 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 we can grow better than that. We, we can do better than that. Hold on a second. Oh, you're looping over yourself. There you go. Yeah, wait a second. <laughs> Meet this. I want to. I want to say this. To that, right? And then they have cans of soup. Soup, and they throw the cans of soup. That's better than a brick because you can't throw a brick. It's too heavy. <laughs> but a can of soup, you can really put some power into that, right? And then when they get caught, they say, "No, this is soup from." My <laughs> It's incredible. And you have people coming over with bags of soup, big bags of soup, and they lay it on the ground and the anarchists take it and they start throwing it at our cops, at our police. And if it hits you, that's worse than a brick because it's got force. <laughs> it's the perfect size. It's the perfect paper. You know... And when they get caught, they say, no, this is just soup for my family. <laughs> soup for my family. And then the media says, this is just soup. These people are very, very innocent. They're innocent people. Oh my God! It's just my favorite. And also, by the way, thanks for the idea, Don. You gave thousands of people that idea. Mm-hmm. And also, you simultaneously made soup illegal. So I'm sure the the, sh- the stakeholders at Campbell's are really happy with you. Good job. So, I mean, was there? Would you say there's any truth to what he was saying? No. There's no one using soup to to no. break. No. You know why? Because it it as it turns out, um, feeding your giant. Uh, conglomerate of uh, so-called domestic terrorists, depending on who you ask. Um, feeding a thousand people uh, is really hard. And like feeding a thousand people with donations is also really hard. Mm-hmm. And so like soup and stuff, those stuff kind of, that, that stuff became part of like a big part of like how people survived. Because, yeah. you know, I, I in the three weeks I was there, I didn't have to buy food one time. <laughs> Someone somewhere was always like, hey, I got this thing. Hey, I got that thing. Oh, you want some of this? Here, here, here's some chili. And like the effects that chili have on the soul at four in the morning when you're walking <laughs> around the street by yourself. You're glad they installed porta potties. Oh my God. Yeah. I was, first of all, it, it just gives you a hope because it's four in the morning and it's cold and it's gray and it's raining a little bit because it's Seattle. And <laughs> you're like, you know what? Soup, soup for my family. Yeah. So <laughs> I was impressed with, uh, walking around Chop and seeing that there was a lot of areas where they had food available to protesters that were there, I, I would imagine to encourage them to not have to worry about that so they could continue to help the cause. And like they had this one thing called the No Cop Co op. Yep. They had free food and supplies there, and a lot <sighs> everything was donations. And I just felt like you know there's a lot of a lot of resources uh, there, a lot of support. Well, there was a ton of support, and and it was really interesting to see just how much support there really was. And and this was this was something that was eye opening from as someone who's from the disaster relief community. Yeah, is that like. In disaster relief, you know, we, 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 we've we seen big numbers and we see big donations roll in and stuff like that. But to see something this small with this much political so-called intrigue into it, like get this much support, it really changed our minds as to like maybe we should be looking at the world in a different way. Like what if we actually do a good job of managing these micro donations and like – because these people aren't donating a hundred dollars. They're they're giving, you know, fifteen, twenty bucks worth of food. They stop at a QFC, pick up a couple things, drop it off. And then they'd, you know, read the list and come back the next day if they had something up. And you know, that that's just kind of how it worked. And like the food was almost never an issue because there's always somebody on that fucking hustle to make that happen. Yeah. And we had like chefs show up. We had like pro chefs show up just like, hey, we wanted to do something. We're bored. We're out of work. We don't have anything to do. So we're yeah. going to make you some really bomb Tokyo dogs. It's like the perfect storm because it's like the same time that Chop uh, was becoming a thing. People are, are like unemployed because of the pandemic and people are like looking for a way to get involved. And so there's a lot well, they're, of, they're lot looking, of sh- they're looking for a way to be a part of something again. Yeah. Because everything that we like, we're looking forward to this year, like it's slammed to a stop and, yeah. and, and, you know, no one was, was really ready for that, at least psychologically or, or from a, you know, a hope standpoint. <laughs> so, the, so let's talk yeah. about, let's talk about this famous scene 
which is uh, this is this made national yes. news as well. So there was a standoff with police and protesters. So if you pause it for a quick second, let me just point out something that's really sure. really obvious. So as someone who knows the slightest thing about how do you not get hit in the head with a rock? Uh, the answer is you make space. Now look how close onto each other they are on this line. The police are standing right behind the barricade. And the thing is, the closer you are to your barricade and the crowd of people in front of you, the less you can see. And so they're they're actually severely limiting their ability to to see in this situation because they're so close to the crowd. Why are they so uphill. close? It's a it's an it's an effect to basically make that barrier feel more real because or if you like notice, an intimidation tactic. It's an intimidation tactic. Yeah, it's designed to make this line feel impassable. But the thing is, if you look at uh, as the week progressed, you'll notice that the the line, the distance between the barricade and where the cops were, got bigger and bigger and bigger as the week went on. Because of this exact incident, like when you watch it, look how close they are, and it's because of the proximity between both sides that this incident <laughs> happened at all. So what's the deal with this umbrella? Can you set this up? They so the umbrellas are basically to keep you from getting maced. And then, yeah, you can didn't see. Didn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. Well, it didn't work in this situation. No. They and, well, I mean, it, it, it hypothetically does work if, you know, everyone opens them up together and keeps them close. But yeah. they ripped this umbrella from this protester. Yeah. And like, then just started. Like nothing was happening. And they pulled it out of their hand yeah so like to me this seems like this should have never happened they no, shouldn't have pulled, her, um, pulled the umbrella away no and, and it's like wh what for dude like and, and that that solidified the pink umbrella as like it became a symbol people got of the tattoos movement. dude yeah it's still this i feel like it is like a, a, a symbol i think of it's one movement. of the few symbols that i i, t I have taken away from from that because like if you see someone with a pink umbrella in seattle now it means something because I don't really use an umbrella, <laughs> but I carry it. I have a pink umbrella now, and, yeah. and and I and I use it when I need umbrellally things, just as my little statement. Because everyone else kind of knows. If you're from Seattle, you know what a pink umbrella means. Yeah, man. I. This is a different. Is this from the top? Yes, yeah, it's the the uh, top down. Well, anyway, I just remember seeing this on TV and thinking. Uh, people are going to see this as police um, escalating the situation, that they had an opportunity to de-escalate this and by yanking this umbrella away and macing the crowd. Is it, is it mace? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just I just feel like this is not going to look good. The optics of this does not look good. And so I believe this, ha I don't remember the exact day this happened, but... Um, that was Monday, I want to say. Okay. Monday or Tuesday. Because I remember by, I think it was Tuesday was the day that I went was the day after that. But it, it was not too long before the police boarded up and moved out of the East Precinct. Because I yeah. remember them talking about it. Um, I just, I just They moved out the night of the 8th. Okay. So, so the they night moved of the 8th, they basically, or the day of the 8th, they packed everything up. But by 4 o'clock, they left the, the precinct. Okay. And so... Allegedly, now this is just an allegedly. Allegedly, because State Patrol was like, we're trying to tell you guys how to do this, and you guys won't listen to us, and so we're not going to help you anymore. And <laughs> Seattle PD was like, fine, then when we're leaving, and then they did. <laughs> then they had to. <laughs> so I don't know how true that is, but I got that from a source within uh, State Patrol. So tell me about. And so, first of all, wait a second. Let's see if we can get this to come up. Tell me about this sign. Where did this sign come from? So this was... That's like when you come into CHOP, that would be like one of the first things that I saw, I remember. Could you blow that up? Could you make that a little bigger? Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Yeah, so this was... Okay, so this is already... Like the three demands. Yeah, these are the three demands. And so this was I want to say that's 12th Avenue. Yeah, I guess my my first yeah. my first question about this is how do demands arise for the entire movement if there's no leadership? Where did, how did was there a group of people that got together and said what do we want and 
and let's put it on this sign so that when the media shows up, they have something to all focus around. But then I'm just wondering, like, how does that messaging even get there if there's no leadership? I don't understand how they got to those three. I would really like to know the answer myself. Like, where did it come from? That's what I want to know. You know, it's the Cotton Eye Joe of like, you know, when you, (laughs) you're like, where did it come from? Where did it go? Because I I, I saw the sign. I remember seeing the sign. I only saw it for a couple days. Yeah. And then I didn't ever see it again. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, the messaging is on point to where no one would uh, disagree with it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, well, there, they, this was the, the demands cause there's two lists of demands. There's the, the short three, there's the high five. And then there's like the 37 long, uh-huh. this long. but this is like, I guess whoever came up with this list was smart cause they know how people are not able to track a lot or think about a lot. Like they, they like, Short and concise short and messaging. And yeah. I think that's where the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement kind of fell short. Is there? Were, I think it was too, too spread out all over the place, yeah. and everyone wanted different things. But well, where it's like, if you can concentrate on a a goal, and everyone pushes that really hard, I feel like you're more likely to affect uh, an, a change with that. Yeah, and like the thing that I thought was really interesting was like when you see a lot of the different groups that like came together to put forth demands and like you know as you can see they have a, they have a website tinyurl.com slash defund SPD. Yeah. So like they they had already put together something like they already knew that they were going to have to do that at some point, and so it, it's just kind of like you know, but it was so strange because you I saw three or four different lists of demands in my time there, and like that just shows like. Each one of these people has the, the capability to become a revolutionary leader. Just the issue is, is that because they're not all talking to each other, because we're not all coordinating, like it's n- nothing's going to happen because there's there's so much disconnect between all these different groups that like ultimately on that list, everything was basically saying the same thing. It was just some people were being more picky about what they needed, quote unquote, to have versus what they wanted to have and all these other things like you know, they wanted at least 50%, defund SPD at least 50%. And I know for a fact, as someone who did, has dealt with budgets and budgetary options, that's not going to happen. And not, not like in a, a, in a one day vote kind of thing that has to happen. You, what has to happen is that the, the system has to prove that the replacement system has to prove that it's doing a better job than the one before it. And so like, we have to give the fact that like, okay, they gave us, you know, 5% this year, but if they cut it by another 5% next year, we're down 10 total. And like, you know, that's X amount of million dollars. And, and but the thing is, we have to have all of these other systems step up and rise to the occasion. And that's kind of the thing that bothers me is that like we I, I see a lot of people kind of disengaging from this fight when in reality you need to be engaging in it into a different stage. Because the truth of it is, is that if we want to see law enforcement change, right, and we want to see this, their their responsibilities change and simplify, or we want to see them just doing law enforcement, not dealing with mental health, not dealing with, um, you know, domestic violence, not dealing with, like, just doing policey stuff, where you go and you arrest somebody, like, a crime has already happened kind of thing. If if we simplified that, and, and if we made that more of a, a collective goal where everyone's like, okay, I want to be part of that change. I want to be a part of that change. The way that you become a part of that change isn't by sitting by the side and screaming at the thing that's not working anymore. It's to build the thing that replaces the thing that's broken. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the thing that I, I, I try to, I wish I could see more people doing. And, 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 and it could be my fault. It could just because I'm not reaching in the right corners to find these things. But when you look at it, like essentially what it comes down to is, is really whether or not we as a people are willing to build for ourselves the future we want. Because the system that's been put in place now is a system of law enforcement that is born and created entirely out of a racist system. So for us to fix that, that requires all of us to realize that this is a problem. And if that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean going out and burning down your local police station. Sometimes that means Getting the people that you don't like the least, you know, law enforcement officers in this case, maybe even, and finding a way to understand from their perspective what it takes to make them want the same change. Mm -hmm. Because when I when I talk to law enforcement officers about about law enforcement reform and I'm like, would your job get easier if you didn't have to deal with mental health stuff? And they always say yes. And, And realistically, like cops aren't trained. They're only trained for eight hours for mental health stuff. In the whole 720 program. I mean, I don't think at the end of the day, I imagine that this all comes down to money. That police officers would probably in some ways be relieved to not have to deal with some of these situations. 
I think it's just about the departments not wanting to take a pay cut. Well, it's because right? the, 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 the department can ask for X amount of money because it has such responsibility. Yes. And so like as and, that, and this is the problem is that like, for example, in Washington State, and this kind of feeds into one of the things that happened. Um, we had to deal with a, a couple of mentally ill people that needed transportation to an additional facility for further care because we couldn't we couldn't take care of them. And when we had those situations, we had to call the police, the very people whose whose house we were were parked in front of um, that weren't very happy with us. And we had to get them to actually show up to help us, to help us with these mental health problems, because there was no other way. Because in, literally in Washington State, a law enforcement officer, a sworn LEO, has to sign the piece of paper that says this person is not fit for this. And then they can go in for a 24-hour um, protective hold, essentially, so they can evaluate their mental health and see if they get better. And and most of the cases that we were dealing with, it was mostly drug-induced stuff. So I knew it wasn't going to be something where they're going to be in for long periods of time, hopefully. But... It was one of those things to where we had to, like, we just don't have the resources to deal with naked people running around. And, like, you know, we, we don't have the means for that. We can't protect them. We can't help them. We can't save them from themselves. So it required a lot to be able to get all these different. And, you know, you, you have to, I don't know, there's just so much, there's so many opportunities that you have in the world to where you can, like, make a stand and say, like, this is the thing that I want to see in the world but being able to actually do the things that make that happen are two very different things. Yeah. So tell, make your stand, but figure out what your next step is. Tell me about what was the environment like down there from your experience? From my experence. Yeah, was, I wanted um, to show Yeah, I wanted to got? show uh the Seattle Police Pre- Department East Precinct. What was were you around when this picture everyone, was taken. Well, when everyone moved into this area and like was, you know, they'd basically quote unquote taken it over and, and someone spray picture. painted over police people. I think yeah. that that was a very um, pivotal moment as well. Like the, I think the pink umbrella was a pivotal moment. And I think the spray painting, the words people over the word police was a pivotal moment in the timeline of CHOP. Yeah. I think the big thing was being able to have something that like you could look at that and say, this is change, right? It definitely and looks like it certainly looks like it. have, it's got the visuals. It definitely looks like as from a, from an optics perspective, it looks like the protesters have more of a, control over the situation now. i'm just gonna say it as someone who's done has done uh like uh what do you call it concept art like i've looked at a lot of concept art in my life this shit looks like concept art for like the division three and like we, we used to joke about it and we and because like we just we used to say like man this just looks like this is a great pre-off of this new game coming out because like man everything is so crazy like this is no way this is real life uh-huh. because it, it was it's just so alien yeah um because like when you look at this though like the the truth of it is, is that like all of those different people down there, each one of those people is there making a difference, but each one of those people has a different end goal for what they want here. Yeah. And that's that's kind of really the, I guess, the the disadvantage to, to what happened is that like you can't necessarily know that like, hey, this isn't going to work. But like as far as like pivotal moments, like seeing Seattle People's Department there every day, like I'd walk by that thing every day. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it just kind of became, for me, like this whole area just felt like a, a strange second home. And it, it felt like I was going to work still, though. It still felt like I was going to work. And then I, you know, I'd suit up, get all my shit on, put my stinky boots on. And then I'd go down and just pick up other people's problems for the next eight to 12 hours. Well, I'm not going to lie. When I first saw this, I was shocked that police abandoned it i was like wait they really did yeah. <laughs> i was like are you kidding me <laughs> i know I, I literally got in the car that day and I, I like grabbed my camera equipment and i got down there and i ran out there and i was just like what yeah. the actual fuck is going yes. on here so because right here they had like a huge fucking argument in that corner and that it was that argument that made me realize like oh shit someone needs to do something to help stabilize this at least a little bit And whether that was me or that was anyone else, uh, if someone else came along before me, then I would let them do it. But no one did. Yeah. So another another thing that uh, that gorgeous that came out of chop. There was a lot of just amazing art installations and graffiti uh, that. um, So this was a 
like a, a, a well, how would you describe this? It's a massive, it's about a 25 ish, 20, 25 ish foot tall black power fist. Yes. And it was the, lifted up by like a hundred people. Yeah. It was assembled by hand in the yard, or as far as I remember. And then they basically just like lifted it up. Yes. Um, and put it up and braced it up against the thing. And they basically turned it into a permanent installation. Yeah, where is this now? I know they took it down. I don't know where it ended up. I hope um, they didn't destroy I it. I know they didn't. As far as I know, they didn't destroy it. But it's pretty impressive. It's fairly impressive. And like, as far as like a piece of strange Seattle history. Yeah. That's, you can stick that in another park. It should go like, in Fremont. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it needs to go opposite the Marxist Lenin statue. Or maybe just put it back here. Um, and then, of course, there is the mural. The mural I, I will describe as the coolest scar on this city from the whole thing. Uh, what do you mean by that? As far as like, because like when you, at that time when we were standing there and we're looking at all of this stuff and we looked at this just like, and I'm getting chills thinking about it. And we, we were standing there watching them paint this. And, and I have pictures of me walking alongside them as they're doing it. But they basically literally... Um, like each different artist had their own thing. And so like watching this happen, it it was more of a, it was as much an art piece watching the whole thing go together as it was viewing it at the end. And when I looked at it and I looked at all the other graffiti on all the walls and all the other art that I knew was going to come and go. And I, and I walked through here yesterday just to kind of get my head in the right space to, for today, just to remember what it was like. And they, they had repainted it. They have repainted it now that they've sealed it. Um, and it, like I said, it, it's one of the most beautiful scars on the city that, that mm -hmm. will come from this because everything else, like the, the fort around East Precinct, that's not pretty. Um, all the graffiti on the Richmark building, which used to be a gorgeous mural, that's kind of a bummer for me personally as an artist. Um, the amount of graffiti still up on the walls around there is insane. And like, you know, there's lots of scars from the chop, but like, I think personally there's times and places for scars to be pretty. And I think that's one of the prettiest scars the city's ever going to have. How long it stays there is, is a whole other measure of that though, because if it's only there for another year, then, then it's not worth it. Yeah. You know? I was going to see if I could, let's see, show what is, this is what chop looks like now. I mean the, the East precinct. Yeah. It's when you say it's not pretty, it's like, it looks like, like a, it's it's yeah it's literally like a giant concrete it's a nine foot high concrete wall that goes all the way around east precinct uh -huh. and like <laughs> yeah it's a lot different now it's a lot different now and like you know these guys are all talking about it like it's a good thing and it's like hey guys look well they're probably happy they got their they're just happy they can go to check in on work yeah they got their place you know? back but it definitely. I don't. I don't have any personal ire against any one police officer for being a police officer. It's just one of those things where it's like, in that chaotic moment, I call it the chaotic. Uh, it's the what is it? Um, it's the chaotic something complex. Basically, it's basically like the more chaos you add to a situation, the more likely the situation is to go beyond a, a particular individual's sense of morality because you no longer feel accountable to just the self. And so like, you know, like I, I'm never gonna, I, I don't hold a grudge against any of those guys. Cause like, you know, they're doing a job too. And in my opinion, I'm doing a job that's opposite of theirs, but it doesn't mean that, well, it's not even opposite of theirs. It's, it's actually a lot of the same shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my friend who is a, a state patrol officer was like, you know, you, you actually sound like my sergeant. Like what you do is like, you, you're just going around micromanaging all these people's dreams and ambitions. And all you have to do is just make sure they don't fucking kill anybody. And it's like, that's what was kind of really bizarre to me is just like, wow, there's a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of similarities between the two, but the way that we go about them are very different. You know, yeah. we don't use force. We use time. Maybe in some ways you're modeling behavior that they should emulate. Well, wh what I say is that we have to do what's called reputation-based policing. Because if you, if you make a judgment call that you need to deal with the situation and then somebody doesn't agree with you and they get you thrown out it doesn't matter if you stop that one situation but you now are enabled to stop the rest of these situations and so you have to use your brain about like whether or not i can engage in the situation whether or not this is going to affect my reputation too much now that's not necessarily something that 
law enforcement officers are going to get the, the satisfaction of being able to do. But what it is, is it is an opportunity for them to be able to think like that. Mm-hmm. Because you don't need to use the most of your, uh, you know, you don't need to use all of your charter of power. You can communicate your means. You can do a lot of things in a lot of ways. And I've met a lot of officers that are really, really good at this over the years. But the thing that I found is that, like, for us, we had to maintain our relationship with the public as a whole, whereas law enforcement doesn't have to. They don't care. They're not interested necessarily. But they should. But they really should. And and, and they've, they're learning that they should because they, they've learned this over the last 10 years or so that, like, they really do need to engage with their community a little more because otherwise it really does become an us versus them mentality. And the thing is, is that if we as people also feed into that us versus them mentality, that also doesn't help the situation too much either. But like in reality, like the situation is so much more complex than us versus them. And so like when people try to make it like a, oh, well, you don't you hate cops. It's like, no, we had to work with cops the entire time because whether or not we wanted to, there were rapes, there were a sexual assaults, there were real crimes happening in there, there were shootings. And like when there are shootings, that changes the name of the game entirely. You basically need to work with the police in that instance, especially when you're looked as to, you know, the responsible sort. And, and people want answers. And his family wants answers. You know, when people want answers, that's when it turns into a whole other thing. Because now you're trying to, you know, it's one thing to, to deal with mental health calls. It's a whole other thing to be like, time to do CSI. We're not going to do that. It's just not in our training. It's, it's, that's entirely within exactly what law enforcement is created to do. Yeah. So, like, I think it's a really interesting example as to, like, the two worlds of, like, what could you get away with without law enforcement? And what could you, what do you need law enforcement for? And so there's certain situations where I'm like, yeah, we need cops for that. There's just, like, I don't want to deal... Like, if there's a mass shooting, you don't want, you don't want cops for that. Yeah. You, you want, don't want to send in a, a team want, of mental health professionals to try to talk a guy out of machine gunning a crowd of people. You want guns for guns. Yeah. You, sometimes you need guns for guns. And sometimes that's not, it, does, it doesn't feel right. And then sometimes it's not right. And then you looked at, like, what happened at the, towards the end, and it wasn't. But there are times when you need that level of response. But having that come from a trained professional that has a certain set of expectations is actually really nice for that situation. So like, I don't personally have a huge problem necessarily with what, like there are certain times where you need police, but it doesn't mean that they need to be responding to 80% of the calls that have nothing to do with them, you know? Yeah. So, um, Trump, he was pretty outspoken about CHOP on June 10th and June 11th, he was referring to uh, occupants of CHOP, I guess it was called CHAZ at the time. Yeah, it was CHAZ. Uh, as un- ugly anarchists and demanding that the governor of Washington and the mayor of Seattle, quote unquote, take back the zone. Mayor Jenny Durkin described the area on June 11th as four blocks in Seattle within a block party atmosphere, a common occurrence for Capitol Hill, stating it's not an armed takeover. It's not a military junta. John? Yeah, junta. Junta? What does that mean? Uh, Junta is basically a a military force that occupies a government and then takes over it. Okay. So it's a military-run government. On June 14th, USA Today reported a festive environment comparing the protest to a miniature version of Burning Man. Even I said there's even a great sign where people were protesting the environment. Uh, This guy saying, this is not Chazella. I guess because... My my take on this is that this is all this was already an area where people love to go and hang out, um, and so it's like that is like a it's like a melting pot between that mixed with the protests, and then some of the protesters being like, "You guys can't hang out and just hang out. This is like not a hangout spot." <laughs> so that's that's when. So that was roughly the what day did that pop up what do you know what does it say uh the 14th i think june 14th 14th? yeah so 14th and 15th was right as the divide really started Mm. so prior to that there had been no internally organized leadership um at all like zero and so essentially it was just like us doing our own little thing on the on the borders just to make sure that like we weren't the story which is which is which is the number one thing that you should always do whenever you find yourself in a situation where the media is pointing at you is don't make the story about how you don't like the media Mm -hmm. because that's the instant way to have the whole country hate you. 
because any like because we see the freedom of the press as this holy thing, right? And so if you're denying people freedom of the press, then you know that gets ugly. But yeah. what ends up happening is you want that, them to work with you. Yeah. And so, like, I spent a lot, most of my time was dealing with CNN and MSNBC and talking to Fox, even though they don't like us. And, like, I feel bad for Dan Springer. Yeah. <laughs> that poor Fox correspondent. But he, it's ha- you know, 30 years ago when he was covering WTO, he had a hard time now. <laughs> He's had a hard time since. But I, I imagine if you see somebody with a Fox News microphone, you probably just. Well, like, they oh. lied to us. That's what I was getting at is, like, you probably feel like they're, no matter what you say, they're going to. R- run a story that's going to paint this place in a negative light. Like even the top of the subreddit is a picture of how they were talking about the border between America and- Yeah, the and... U.S. Chaz border. Yeah, I mean, it's so sensational. Like, I'm, But it... I mean, they gave us a lot of, you know, that makes us seem very legit. <laughs> <laughs> Made me want to build a little stand, you uh-huh. know, with just like the little, like, uh, I don't know if you ever played Papers, Please, but, it, you know, just like a little thing where you can stamp, like get like, yes, I love I the idea. It. Like, actually, yes. now that I think about it, we fucking, we missed a great opportunity. But I guess what I'm getting at is that they are more focused on trying to scare people scare people and to make them think that this is a bad thing and i think that maybe the messaging of why why they're there gets lost because they're so concerned about the 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 fear-mongering of oh it's scary black people with guns or they're gonna come at come well, into it, your neighborhoods too like that kind of like um uh, is a distraction from they're here for a reason and we should be focusing on that reason yeah well, and then and then you t- include the part where they like you know cut in footage from Minneapolis, and it's like okay now you're not even telling a, the story at all. Right. Well, a truthful story. Yeah. Right. And, and that's where I say like there's many truths in the world, and like you have to find the truth that is the one you're most willing to see. And like often for me, the the truth that I trust is the truth that I see. And so like being out there and being able to see it firsthand, being able to know that like oh the media doesn't have the slightest clue as to how to report on this thing because they also it's it's unprecedented in its own way like when you look at it occupy did exist longer but it was a smaller area with a less kind of i don't know ambitious whatever and and so like it 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 kind of is its own unique set of problems for the media to report on but the media always finds this hilarious way to do a really shitty job because like and, and there's lots of it, you know, a journalist that I talked to that I loved that did a great job. But like, there's lots of times where like, you know, they filmed a segment and they did a really good job with that segment. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. And then it gets to the editing floor and then it's just gone. But like at that point, it's not their fault. They're just as frustrated with not being able to tell the story as I am. So like, I, I get why people want, you know, people in the media are very frustrated with this, you know, top down style of, of reporting. Because even though I'm talking to Cole and he's taking, he was the, he was, you know, he was a guy from Como and Como hated us, but he, he was, my, he was my like Como pet project where I was like, all right, Cole, I'm going to be honest with you a hundred percent because so far you've been pretty honest with me a hundred percent. So like, I'm not going to feed you any bullshit as long as you don't report any bullshit, but that I'll be a good source for you doing those things. But like, if you fuck me over on this, I'm not going to give you any more information. And so like, and, and it was really interesting because he, you know, he proved it to me that like these guys still have that art, that, that like journalistic integrity. Mm-hmm. And so I respect the hell out of Cole for that because he really did take, he understood his position in the situation. He understood my position in the situation. And he just was that piece of integrity that we needed in that own way, just to be able to get anything to Como because everything else, they were just making up on their own on the edges. They didn't even come in. You know, it was pretty much only Cole and, like, one other guy that would come into the actual chop. Yeah. So the more you could get actual reporters in there the, and work with them, the, the the more accurate of a depiction, hopefully, you would get out disseminated to the people in Seattle and across the country. And that's yeah. The, the, the hope is that you partner with them instead of try to create make them a villain and shun well, them. Well, you know, my number one thing was to give them the availability they wanted. Mm-hmm. So if they want to be able to go around and just walk around and, and film stuff, like that that was like the first thing I, uh, one of the first measures I had to do from like a leadership deci- standpoint was really, 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 really deciding the fact that like, hey, these people are the people that are going to tell the rest of the world as to what's going on. We know what's happening here. But regardless... 
They're going to tell the world that something is happening here. So whether or not we work with them controls our ability to actually be able to make that stuff happen. Because if we, if we try to control their narrative, then we're doing ourselves a dissatisfaction. We're doing ourselves a, a giant, a huge, a huge liability problem because like, if we're trying to say like, oh yeah, no, <laughs> well, you know, the, the media and I don't get along, get lost, that doesn't help us because then that allows the media to, to say and do anything and they don't have to even be put in front of the right people. Yeah. You don't have to have them talk to the victims. You don't have to have them talk to all these people. You don't have to have them discover those gardens. You don't have to have them walk around and find all these beautiful art installations. But if they do, then that's another piece that they can choose to reflect on because these yeah. people still have journalistic integrity and you still got to respect that a little bit, you know? Now, USA Today reported a festive environment during the day, but there were also other organizations like the Star Tribune. They were reporting that at night, the atm atmosphere would become more charged, quote unquote, as d demonstrators would march and arm armed volunteer guards uh, would keep watch. Um, SPD Chief Carmen Best expressed that the department was looking to reduce their footprint, but later clarified that officials aimed to return officers to the precinct as it was, quote unquote, paramount that they were able to respond to calls in a timely fashion. Um, on June 12th, Black Lives Matter protesters negotiated with local officers to leave the zone the size of CHOP, then de decreased four days later when roadblocks were replaced and moved. CHOP continued to shrink in size following the shootings uh, in or near the zone on June 20th, 21st, and 23rd when some of the occupiers left. And Durkin responded that the SPD would return peacefully and in the near future. On June 28th, she met with protesters and informed them that the city planned to remove most barricades and limit the area with activists to the East Precinct building and the street directly in front of it. And that day, CHOP organizers expressed their intention to refocus on the area near the police station and away from the sprawling encampment at Cal Anderson Park after it became a political liability as they struggled to maintain security. And I guess what they mean when they say that, it says in the early mornings of June 29th, there was a shooting that left a 16-year-old boy dead and a 14-year-old boy in critical condition with gunshot injuries. And... Um, Chief Best said that this situation was dangerous and unacceptable and told reporters that enough is enough. We need to get back into this area. So what can you what can you tell me about so, that situation? That's a lot. It's a lot. But essentially what had happened was. So we have to break this down in a different way, because in order to understand a little bit about what we were dealing with on the ground between um, when the shooting started, we have to dig a little bit into Seattle gang history. So traditionally, uh, the Central District Bloods controlled um, Capitol Hill. They had basically from 10th Avenue all the way up to like 15th, 23rd, like they had a, that whole chunk was basically theirs. And so that's why Capitol Hill used to kind of be a dangerous area because it was kind of a, a gang affiliated area. And so as that changed, the, all these people got decentralized and priced out, but this was still their neighborhood. This is still where they grew up, right? And so what ends up happening is that Lorenzo, um, you know, God rest him, like was just there playing a dice game. And like, you know, he would, he was not like a fighter or anything like that. Cause I, I had to talk to his brother the day after and I had to meet the family. And, and basically what happened was, is that like the, Old school guys like I don't know I don't know there's another gang called DW they um they're they're down with the crew is I think what they're called and they're from Southside and so what happened is like this ten year long gang war that had been silent for you know ha without a shot fired since like 2008 or something like that all of a sudden kicks off again in the chop and like that's where we made the decision like we pulled out on the 23rd. Because we we just realized that like the, this situation is now beyond the half life point, and it is only going to get exponentially more dangerous from here. Because after the first shooting, there was immediately a second shooting within ten minutes, mm -hmm. and that that told me right away like we can't 
this is starting to go downhill because people are now realizing they can get away with shootings in this area. We can't continue to allow that to happen. We either need to decentralize ourselves and move our protests somewhere else, which is what we were originally planning on doing, was that they were originally supposed to move, except the organizers, quote unquote, didn't get it together enough to where people actually moved because everyone had already set up their infrastructure in Cal Anderson. Yeah. Now, if we go back, uh, I think at the beginning of that, it says that the, the chop got smaller when they put the concrete blocks in. It's because, so what happened is that they put concrete blocks in and they basically tried to drop it from a six block area. They basically tried to give 12th Avenue back. And for me personally, 12th Avenue isn't really that important to the cause because 12th Avenue, when you look at it, it's just the road that the, the police station's on. And so because it's the road that the police station's on now, people are like, well, we want to we wanna be able to prevent them from sneaking into the police station. It's like, dude, what are we going to do? We're not going to stop the fucking police. We're not going to be able to stop the cops when they decide they want their police station back. Yeah, it's kind of unreasonable. It's kind of unreasonable to expect that we're going to be able to hold this whole area, especially with the fact that you guys are now essentially hold the neighborhood hostage. Because at, at, at the time of the 15th, when those blocks went in, we were saying, like, we need to be able to let these people live their lives and these, let these businesses live their lives normally. Because if they can't live their lives normally, they're not on our side. And if they're not on our side, we are gone. And I was saying that, over, I spent that all fucking day. I said that all day for fucking 18 hours that day. I was walking around dealing with other people's like, why are they putting these blocks in there? God, they're making our zone smaller. And I'm like, yeah, they're making our zone smaller, but they're actually giving us protection for the first time. Because spoiler alert. We're talking about this. Yeah. So spoiler alert is that like all of the barricades around it were empty. Like all the little orange barricades that you saw, like in all the pictures that look all like tough, those are empty. Mm-hmm. And and con- and construction companies do that all the time. Yeah. So here comes the blocks in. If you can make that bigger. Yeah. So that's uh, no cop, but yeah, that's them putting in these blocks. And yeah, they bring them in with and like. I had a guy try to like block them putting in the blocks by like laying down in front of it. And I had to go talk to them and just be like, look, dude, they just spent God knows how much money putting in literal defenses for us against the vehicles that we are so afraid of. Why are we losing our shit about this? Yeah. And it was because they're like, no, this is them. They're just stripping our power from us. And they turned it into this thing where it was like, they're boxing us in um, we're just going to become like, we're just fish in a barrel this way. And it's like, clearly you guys don't tactically understand that we are already a fish in the barrel. Yeah. And that's the actual plans that they put together. And so also no parking on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the art there is still like, that's my favorite part of everything that happened was just the art. There it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so should we keep going through this? Yeah, let's keep, let's bust <laughs> okay. through this. I'm kind of oh curious now. How are we, um, where are we at? Let's see. It's well, it's interesting to relive the timeline. Yeah, because um, by because when they put the blocks in, essentially what happened was that it was that same day that a lot of the S- Seattle BLM people showed up, uh, and they hadn't been there before. So I was kind of like, what do we do with this group of people that doesn't necessarily know the situation as well as we do, but they're um, black. They're telling us what to do. And it's our time. We're supposed to be shutting up and listening. But at the same time, the things that they're telling us to do are stupid. Mm -hmm. And it's not because it's not like it wouldn't be good guidance. It's because they don't understand the more advanced, like the greater level stuff of like, because we've held this place hostage during the time that they're supposed to be reopening for business, it doesn't matter how long we've been here because even though we've only been here for a week, it's like we've been here for three and a half months financially. So they don't give a shit. They are willing to work with us. What we have to do is we have to just be able to to seize to simple, 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 simple demands. Mm-hmm. And they'll be happy because they're they're already, like I said, the gun to the head. They already they already know that it's already bad enough for them that they don't know how to that they have to to deal with the situation in the first place. So they're just going to do whatever makes them money. Yeah. And if you prevent them from making money, they're going to do whatever makes them money, which means hauling your ass out. And so now we have this new group of leadership show up on this day. 
and they start bossing us around. I got chewed out by some complete stranger that I don't know. He who had never been there for the last week and a half. All of a sudden shows up and starts chewing me out, telling me that because I'm white, I don't know anything, and my opinion doesn't matter. Now, I'm not going to be offended and say that, like, you know, how dare you say something like that? But at the same time, dude, it's that type of thinking that got us here. And, like, what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to listen to the people that know something about a situation that have offhand knowledge that you don't have yeah, and give them the opportunity to be able to glean something onto you instead of you just sticking your foot in and saying, no, this is this way because I said so and I'm this thing. Yeah. Just, just being open-minded you... to to intelligence. Well, yeah. But at the same, like, I remember I had a guy come up to me once and, like, cuss me out about, like, why I was telling him to get off the radio and to not deal with the situation. He's like, blah, 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 who the fuck are you? And I go, I'm Slate. And he goes, who? And I go, Slate, essentially your fucking boss. And he just looked at me like, oh, super shit. And he apologized to me like nonstop because like that's the whole thing. Like people knew who I was like through all these different chats and stuff, but they didn't necessarily know how to put it together. But that's the whole thing is it's like all of a sudden you have these people that are with different ideologies that think that they're in control of the situation because they feel empowered by the space that we've created for them. Except now they're telling us how to do how to maintain the space we created. Mm hmm. And that's where it's kind of difficult because yeah, complicated. It's like it's more complicated because the people that created the space for them to be able to have that opportunity to make that message from there aren't the same people that were the people making saying the things. And like you, what you have to do is you have to be able to trust the people that created this space, this thing for you to do that really well. And like in that particular instance, if we had pulled back and this isn't like an honest belief, but it's a pretty solid shot in my mind. That if we had pulled back and given the neighborhood a chance to be able to breathe and function the way somewhat normally that a neighborhood would, we would have been able to be there for at least another at least another week and a half, if not longer, because we would have been able to stabilize the situation a lot more. Because having your neighborhood work with the people that are now in the neighborhood that have become a fixture of the neighborhood to make the neighborhood better than it was with the city there or with XYZ there... If we can do that, then we're actually improving the lives of these people and we're making their things better. So, like, you know, they would say that to us, like, hey, could we get this thing moved over here? And I'd be like, yeah, let's grab 10 guys and we'll move that whole line all the way back. And, you know, we'd move mountains for them because they're the people that, like, we, we, those, that's the support that we really needed. And so when these new people came along and didn't give a shit about the support that the neighbor gave, they didn't give a shit about what we had to do to be able to make it so that, like, we could have a functioning piece of this this city still work while simultaneously being a protest stage. Like we had an opportunity to do that and we fucked it up because people got greedy hmm. and they're like, well, we don't want to give up these blocks. Cause then it looks like we're losing strength, but what are we doing? Literally all I'm doing in, in, in these times for the last three days is I've been assigning people to these three posts just because they're there. We haven't used this space for anything. Yeah, And so, like, why are we trying to take more territory when we not only do not need it, we already have a problem maintaining the territory we have. And that's that's where it kind of gets into this bigger thing of, like, what is the right thing to do in that situation? Because yeah. the, the real answer is there isn't a real, there isn't a, a, a correct answer. Or, like, if you could go back and change the past, would you change, what would you change to improve the situation? I think the thing is, is that, like, we should have done a better job of letting people know the barricades were going in mm -hmm. and why we wanted to put the barricades in. But the thing is we, at that point, like th that was so early in the organizational stage, we didn't even have a way to like get people to even get together enough to scream about what they wanted. So it was still so informal that like, we just didn't have stuff set up the right way. I gotcha. And so like, if we had maybe done a better job of being like, Hey, the reason why we're putting this in is because this is literally just to stop the cars. Like if a car charges us, and this pr just got proved later, if a car charges into these barricades, they're not going through it. Yeah, and it's, it's for the protesters' protection that it's they're literally there. for our protection that yeah. they're in here. It doesn't mean that we're limited to the inside of these boxes. We can still roam around outside of it, but we also can't be restrictive to the areas outside of this because yeah. essentially we only need this in the area inside this block. And like I, drew, I redrew a couple lines just to make sure that we could have the blocks where we wanted them. Um. And like making sure that that way we are actually infrastructurally safe. Mm -hmm. We actually have protection with this infrastructure versus the visuals of it being like, well, 
they're giving us these things and they're, they're boxing us in. It's like, no, they're not boxing us in because you can still walk straight through the barricades at any point. No one's going to stop you. No one's going to change. Like, like you can still exercise your right to protest immediately outside of these blocks. Yeah. But people decided to take it personally. They decided to be like, no, this is a slight against us. This is the insult. And even my number two still to this day calls it the insult. He still believes that like he doesn't, that that was insulting to put that in. And, and in my mind, it wasn't attempt. It wasn't an attempt at being insulting as much as it was an attempt at l- true longevity. And when people took that badly, that just was my sign to me. Like, this is going to be over by the end of the month because we're no longer working with the community. And when you don't work with the community, you're not welcome. And so knowing at that point that like, all right, everything's all downhill from here. I went to go get in the car one day and go for a nice relaxing drive. And I come back and then I get a phone call in the morning that there's someone's been shot to death. And it's like, it took literally two days for me to have that realization to it becoming real. It took two days. So two, two days after that shooting we were talking about, um, that was July 1st where our, the Seattle mayor issued an executive order to clear out the area and reclaim the, the East precinct. Um, that was a pretty big milestone I'd say as well because I think maybe people didn't believe that it, it was gonna, like it seemed like that day was never gonna come. Like it almost just seemed like, oh, the protesters have this area now and now it's like, I don't know, it just didn't, it seemed like surreal that that they had finally come back to try to like kick everyone out. I just remember it being, well, first of all, I just want to give myself points on, on the surrealism because it got, hey, there he is. I haven't seen him in a while. Um, yeah, the basically... Kicking everyone out of their tents. Yeah, no, they, they would, they'd go through the thing and they'd basically kick everyone out. And it was at that point that like I had already realized like they're coming. They're going to come in. They're going to beat the shit out of everyone. They're going to mace anybody in the tents if they're going to resist. Like, I need to let the people in the tents know, like, hey, cops are coming. This is your chance to get out if you want. And, like, lots of people started packing. Mm-hmm. And then once the cops started actually, like, sweeping through the thing, it was just a matter of, like, being able to to recognize, like, as a professional, like, to then look and say, like, hey, just a heads up, there's one in that tent. He doesn't want to come out. You don't need to beat him up about it, though. He's going to come eventually. And, like... They would take the extra time to kind of listen to what I had said, which, which That's you know, good. I, at least they, they at some point drew to respect us for what we were trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but at some point, like, you know, when when it's over, it's over. And and the the biggest thing that you have to learn sometimes is you have to learn how to, like, rotate yourself out of a fight to get back into the next one. And like a lot of what people were doing is that they weren't rotating themselves. I'd have people that had been on shift for two weeks straight and I'd have to send people home. I might be like, go home. I need you to go home and go to sleep because I need you to be able to work well. But like so many people just showed up and then just fucking stayed. At no point did they stop. So you're saying sleep sleep deprivation was an issue. Sleep deprivation. mental issues. um, Definitely came into it. Like there's lots of um, just different it was so there's so many different causes as to why things started coming apart but i just remember because like at that point we had been pulled out for a whole week and so we were sitting in a parking lot ready to run medical exfil for things that had happened and we were all kitted up geared up ready to go ready to rock um, if anything happened, like we were ready to jump in and go do something still because we couldn't leave it either. It was really strange. Like even though I had given the order and told everybody to go home, I couldn't sleep at night knowing that there were still people there that I knew. And so I would still show up. And even though I wouldn't let myself be involved in the same way I was before, because previously what, hap- what, what started to happen is that people started to look to us as we're always going to be here and we don't need to learn how to do any of this stuff. And so it's just your guys' problem. And it's like, well, that's not true because we have a limit to like how long we can be here. Like when you're operationally, when you're in it, when you're in doing something sketchy in, a, in another place, you don't want to be there for longer than you have to be. You want to be there until you're effective. And then as soon as you're not effective, you want to get out before you become ineffective and then become a, a statistic. And so 
that's where I was at. I was just like, we need to get as many of these teams that I know and I trust, I want to get as many of these people decentralized and out of here so that they're not as incentivized to keep coming back. And we had people that would keep coming back and keep coming back, keep coming back, myself included, but it just changed the tone of it to where it wasn't, this isn't just a fun club where we all get to get together and stand around in the street while everyone has guns. Because like, by the time the shooting happened, when I looked around, I was there for the second shooting. So, or not the second shooting. So there's technically, I was there for five shootings in total. So the first shooting was the Lorenzo shooting. Second one was the Dwayne, uh, Dwayne. And then the third one was a non, non-lethal, but like six, four shots to the left shoulder, I think it was. Oh my God. And we were there for that one. And like 10 shots pop off and everyone's just like hitting the deck. And then I looked around and like, I had a gun in my hand all of a sudden. And then I looked around and then everyone else had a gun in their hand too. And I just kind of realized like, this isn't the solution. Everybody being armed isn't going to make this better. It's going to make this worse when worse comes to bear. Yeah, it almost it almost comes across like the exact thing that everyone is protesting about, which is excessive force from the police and escalating a situation. It's like almost like you're getting sucked into that mentality of like the oh, amount it's like escalating it and escalating it. well it, it's so funny because for me like watching <laughs> watching people ju- be armed security now that's where i started drawing in my line personally i was like i don't want to have to deal with armed security going around because then that that's entirely outside of my control that sticks on me that's my liability that can reflect on me if i do something that could be potentially liable liable in this action there's lots of ways for that whole situation to go wrong, and I don't want to be there for any of it. And like you could say that's a coward's move, and it kind of is, but in, in, in reality, what it is is it's understanding that it is because our infrastructure was there and that they looked to us as the safety net that they did not see the actual threats around them. Because we, once we discovered that we had 15 missing women, we had, uh, at that point, we had had three shootings. Uh, we had a van full of Central District Bloods members running around on 10th Avenue where Lorenzo got shot with a van full of AK-47s chasing anyone up and down Nagel Avenue that looked suspicious. We can't, we can't, this situation's entirely out of our control. The only thing that we can do to control the situation is fucking not be here. Because the more that we're here, the more that the situation continues to spiral out of control because the more they can say, oh, well, we can't go in there. It's too dangerous. And so like... The police officers, yeah. Yeah, the SP- SPD can stand back and be like, oh, man, look how bad it is. Oh, yeah. geez, but we can't go in there because they don't like us, so... And that, that was one of your biggest uh, gripes that you expressed to me is that... Or that I read in the CNN article yeah. that was published, which I can show a link. If you guys are interested... Uh, and hearing more from Slate, check out the CNN article. It's called They Envisioned a World Without Police Inside Seattle's Chop Zone. Protesters struggled to make it real. But inside this article, something that I was reading that you had said is that, it, you know, the there is this issue where, you know, time is important to get help to people. And mm-hmm. if they're not coming in to help people, that's a problem. Yeah. Essentially what it is is that, like, they created this environment in the first place and then decided to not respond to calls in the immediate surrounding area too. It wasn't that they weren't just responding to calls in the chop. They weren't responding to anything like south of John Street, north of Pike, but east of um, like east of Broadway. Like they wouldn't even go on Broadway. They wouldn't respond to our calls on Broadway. We had uh-huh. to move off Broadway to get them to come to us. Do you think that this was truly because they were concerned about their own safety or do you think that this was a retali- retaliation no. move Retaliation <laughs> move to, to make them, you guys look um, incapable of existing without their help? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Uh-huh. I mean, they, they would intentionally make our lives difficult. Like uh, we had a time where we had a mental health crisis call happening at the same time as a sexual assault call and i was on the mental health call because i'm more familiar with how to do the ins and outs of doing a um involuntary uh, administration or admit in involuntary admittance you know, to get someone involved into to a mental health facility and so i was working on that call and we see a cop car drive by and we're like hey um could we like are you going are you for us or are you for another call and they're like Oh no, we're going to a rape. But they said it in the most, the most sarcastic way. 
And they said it like, oh yeah, no, we're going to a rape. And it was just like, okay, that's cool. Like, I don't, like, that's a real crime too. But like, um, why did you say it like that? Like, you know, like it's one thing where it's like, oh, this is like a bad thing that's happened and we're going to respond to it. Yeah. And, and as someone who's worked and, and like worked alongside law enforcement professionals for years, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is is waving somebody's worst day, like someone's actual sexual assault, yeah. where that guy got arrested? Like we we made sure that guy got arrested because he did commit an actual sexual assault. We wanted him gone, and so the only thought I, that comes to mind for me in defense of them, I, that I could think of would be that they're just so desensitized from working in their line of well, work it, that maybe they have become a little like like nonchalant about it well and, and and i i understand that firsthand because i'm the same way but it, it's the fact that it was the it, and it's beca- and i suppose it's a special sore spot for me because i you know i want to hold law enforcement to a higher standard that we can all trust and when you do shit like that, that that's that's really betraying of that and so like for me i just find that like it was totally 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 frustrating because like that was just an example of just like one of the little ways where they would just be like mm yeah, no, we're going to a real crime. Bye. And like, but it's like, this dude is naked. We have a towel. We have some, we, we can only hold on to him by a towel that we've tied around his waist. So yeah. like, we ended up having to, we ended up getting a, a transit supervisor to help us. And the transit supervisor was like, you know, see that line right there on the at ton at, t- transit tunnel entrance? The second he crosses that line, he's committed a, it's a federal problem and Metro Police will be here no problem. And so we're like, okay, we literally dragged him across the line. And wow. the security guard is like, well, they're in here now. So now we have to come have transit police come transport him. And they came in 20 minutes, uh, not even 20 minutes, like 10 minutes. They came in 10 minutes, four deep, transported this guy, took all of our details, got our reports, got a, took a good report and got the fuck out. They, they responded to the call, no problem. But Seattle PD took two and a half hours to do that. And then when they showed up, they were like, nah. And then they just left us with this guy. Mm. So, so I think this gets at, um, a bigger question that I had for you was just ultimately like, what do you think could have been done better at shop? And I guess clearly one of your answers would be that there would have been more of a collaboration with law enforcement and the protesters to create uh, a safer environment for the freedom of assembly and freedom of speech to occur. You know, that's, that's, well, I guess that's ultimately what I'm saying, but like the way that that is said feels wrong because essentially what I'm saying is that like we as individuals who want to see a change are more responsible, if not just as responsible, if not, like I said, if not more responsible for making the change that we want to see happen. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't make the change that we want to see happen, then we don't end up enabling it, um, to do that but to be the architect of change is a great deal of responsibility and that's the thing that people don't understand is that, like if you want to change something it requires a lot of forethought it requires a lot of background a lot of like we need to do this thing in such a way that like we don't alienate xyz because like that ends up becoming the devil is really in the details because realistically no one wanted the chop the chop just was given to us and it's what everyone decided to make of that space in their own time that really changed what it was, which is why I think personally there's three different chops. There's the first week, there's the second week, and then there's the last week. Each week had an entirely different feel to it. Mm. The last week was kind of scary. It kind of felt like a disaster zone. The second week was kind of inching its way towards there. The first week felt like an arts fair. And like the reason why those things changed was because the situation kept changing. And like it's... And, and like I remember, I, I had somebody come after come after me one time after the fact and just be like, "Why aren't you doing these things differently for this new situation?" In the case, like, "Why aren't we learning from the chop?" And it's like, "When's the next time the police is just going to abandon a police department and Probably. then just hand it to protesters?" Maybe never. It'll literally never happen again in our lifetimes because this was a disaster. It was definitely an experiment. <laughs> it was it was the most interesting experiment and in necessary policing that's ever happened is what we ended up doing. So going back to this sign, yeah. I think this might be like where I'd like to try to end it. Um, as far as CHOP goes, like what do you think it accomplished? When you look at this sign and you think about what these um, concentrated quote unquote demands were that that we would take some of the police budget 
and redirect it towards alternatives that would be better for our local community, that we would uh, use some of the, the tax dollars towards funding black communities, that we would um, protect the protesters that were here exercising their First Amendment rights and to freedom of assembly as well. Like, do you think that um, we have made progress in these areas? I mean, I, I'm interested in so, what your thoughts are around this. A couple things that I can say that are definite, definite, definite changes from this is that, like, previously um, law enforcement used to do this super fun thing where they would just, like, dote you around inside your little patrol area. Like, they'd be like, oh, yeah, you're trying to protest, so we'll, we'll guide you around and keep you safe. Seattle PD did that for all of, like, five years, and then they basically stopped doing it now. Mm-hmm. Because they did it all the way up until the first riot, I think. And after the first riot, they just basically threw that playbook out. Uh, actually, they did it again on Sunday, but they they didn't. They haven't done it since then. They haven't played by their own playbook. And like they had rewritten the rules of how to deal with a protest, and then promptly threw it the fuck away. I don't know why. I couldn't possibly tell you why they threw it away. But like, essentially, like when when you throw away your rule book and your playbook and all of a sudden now this uh, need, which is protester safety, this need is now unfulfilled. And so then the people started feeling it. And so, and it's because of this direct action style of, of movement where like, if you see a problem, fix the problem. And if that means be a part of the car brigade that stops a car from coming through and killing somebody, do that. And that's really what it was about. It was about all these different people coming together to really try to make something happen. And so... Like, even though, like, you could say that CHOP was a failure and that we didn't learn anything at all, it, it, it's more about, like, realistically the fact that there's a whole generation of people in this city that feels enabled to do something directly. And whether or not that's worth anything, it's too early to tell. But realistically, when it comes to the CHOP, the CHOP was, like I said, it's, a, it's an experiment in necessary policing. Mm -hmm. because what is necessary to police to keep a society? What isn't necessary to keep a society within policing? And we found that a lot of stuff that we think is necessary as, or the society thinks is necessary, isn't that necessary. But what is necessary is to be able to spend the time to be able to invest in these problems. And we finding that like being able to have the time to invest in these things rather than have to be called to call to call to call to call to call to call. Being able to have specialists that are willing to latch onto a one particular problem or one particular person and to invest in those people, that could totally change the way we do law enforcement. Because if you, if I've dealt with this particular mental health person or a problem with mental health who's mentally ill, and if I go and I deal with that person and we've got a good rapport, there's no reason for us to send a police officer to go talk to that guy when we can send the mental health professional to go talk to that guy. Because the mental health professional can do basically the same thing all the way up to arrest him. But what we need to do is we need to be able to enable mental health professionals to be able to do that on their own without law enforcement help. And so what we need to do is we need to more cleanly draw the lines between what is and what isn't law enforcement. And then build those systems in the middle. Because as far as all those demands go, all of those demands are designed to literally, those are, what it is is that they're, they're trying to do something instead of Law enforcement, which is an entire, which is the receiving end of a crime happening, right? Crime already happens. So the crime's here. Crime happens. That's where the law enforcement gets involved. What they're trying to do is they're trying to essentially invest in crime prevention. They're trying to prevent the crime from happening in the first place. So how do we fix, fix the socioeconomic factors behind all this stuff that makes it possible for crime to be the easier alternative than any of these other programs? So how do we then build that? And so that's a whole other new monster that we've all started out on. And we need to help it because whether or not it ends up being successful, this is the one time that we get to try an alternative to law enforcement. So what do we do about these programs now? How do you get involved with what is going on in your city right now or your state or whatever? Like, what can you do to be a part of that change? Because you don't need to want to be one of these people to make something happen for them. You just need to do whatever it is that you know how to do to help these people to make this possible. Because if we can make it to, so that when a, you know, a call comes in and they see a man swinging a pipe down the street, instead of calling the cops there, 
they're going to call the mental health professional that's worked with that guy. Like, oh, pipe swinging guy? Yeah, we know it's pipe swinging guy. We know exactly how to grab that pipe from him. <laughs> because when you have Me that, and pipe swinging guy go way back. <laughs> yeah, me and pipe swinging guy go way back. And like, I still have the pipe that he tried to swing at me. Um, but pipe swinging guy and I, you know, we ended up having a rapport after the, f- the second incident because he, like, they had just assumed that we were going to fuck with him, that we weren't going to fuck with him the whole time. And then we started fucking with them. We're like, no, dude, we're going to deal with your ass. And then they stopped fucking with us. They, they went away. But like, it's one of those weird things where it's like, there's all these different people out there that need to be dealt with in a certain way. And if you have the history to be able to understand to work with somebody, then do it. And like being able to do that and to be that person and to rise to that occasion. Yeah. And that's, that's really what the chop was about. The chop was what happens when everyone decides that they're going to rise to the occasion. And we got to see that. It yeah. was really cool until it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great explanation. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, caboose what you said by saying that as far as like Seattle local politics in regards to this first demand um, that, let's see, there was a, a, a report that came out in August where city council approved a cut that was more like it was not 50%, yeah, but they did make a like small, yeah, it was like 3 million out of yeah. 400. I don't know what the but, math is on you that. Know, the thing is 3 million, well, it's it's like something, that, I forget how big the budget is, but it's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny corner. But people fail to understand just how important getting a tiny corner is in the world of budgetary relocation. It's like less than 1%. Yeah, it's less than 1%. It's laughable. But, well, in comparison to 50%. But I think that what they're aiming for is to make a bigger cut next year after exactly. they can after they can flesh out um, how to st- do it in a strategic way instead of like across all of the programs involved. Yeah, because what, basically what they have to do is they have to strengthen the infrastructure for the crime prevention um, in other infrastructure. Areas. So to ways to prevent crime rather than have to enforce crime mm-hmm. or, or enforce law. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to build the crime prevention side up to be just as strong and as effective as the law enforcement side is. Now that requires being able to actually see measurable results from that thing. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to very carefully dip their toe in. And I understand it. It's just, it's not very appeasing to a lot of people. And I'm not sure if it's appeasing to me either because I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's a step. And that's what really matters is that like we're doing something and whether that means we're really, truly separating, like I I can't wait for the day that code enforcement is totally separate from law enforcement and is totally separate from mental health. Because if those three things happen, like you're not going to have to deal with a cop because your car is parked in the wrong spot, but you're going to have to deal with a cop when you kill your ex-girlfriend. Like, but you're not going to have to deal with a cop when you're thinking about killing yourself. And like being able to divvy that up, those are three very different people. And you don't really want to deal with a cop on all of those or any of those really. Because if what if you're black and you, you're unfamiliar and now you had a mental health call except now the cops have showed up and they shot you. What fucking good is that? That doesn't fix anything. I don't know. I could go on forever. But essentially like it just it just drives me crazy when people, f- we need to understand that like the solution that we're going to have for replacing law enforcement is going to take at least a decade. Yeah, it's not an overnight change that you can demand and say I'm going to stay at my, stay and chop until I get it. Yeah, it's, based off of my my studies, like my background study into this, like how do you change crime prevention, law enforcement to crime prevention? Like how do you make that switch? Um, and and in my research, what I found is that it's going to take anywhere from 15 to 25, 30 years mm. for that to even really, because it needs to have a societal effect. It's more than a systemic change. It needs to be a societal change. And those two things need to go hand in hand. And now might actually be the time for those two things to go hand in hand, because I think the society is now hyper aware of it. And I think the system is now hyper aware of it. And so now is the opportunity for us to mesh those two things together and really make something of this. Yeah, apparently someone was telling me about this a program called the Portland Street Response that they're doing in Oregon, yeah, which they're trying to get up and running by 2021. But it's basically sending crisis counselors and EMTs to deal with mental health issues and homelessness. And the idea is that they'd be better equipped than police officers to handle these situations, less likely to escalate um, the situation. Yeah, because I mean, my my training is, is in something very similar. 
So, um, you know, for me, I was trained uh, in a management of aggressive behavior and um, what's the other one called? Uh, you know, like dealing with our mental health first aid. And so being able to identify, like what's really sad is that I discovered that I have more mental health training than your standard BLEA approved officer does just because I went to a class for one weekend. And like, that's kind of depressing. Um, but it, it, it's considering that there's a four hundred million dollar budget yeah. set aside for SPD, yeah. there should be maybe a portion maybe of like that money a, going towards something like that. Yeah, like a bit more, you maybe. know, just like a little bit. Um, but no, like I, I think I think what's really interesting about that whole thing is, is that like they, we like I'd love to see more of that because I know for a fact when I was working downtown, I was more effective at dealing with people than the cops were most of the time, because I knew them. I knew who they were. I knew what they were interested in. I knew what they liked to do in the morning. I knew what they wanted. Like, I knew that if such and such is in a bad mood, he'll throw a bag. He'll throw anything at me. But if if he's in a good way, then then he'll do something. Then then I know I know what to expect. Whereas like I'm yeah. not going to be like, oh my god, shoot him, bah! and yeah. like you know. That sounds like something that everyone can probably agree on is the, that the solution is more help, not less. The solution is finding a way to enable the right type of help for the right type of situation yeah just in time too yeah Yeah. exactly and and like you you have to you need to that requires a more holistic refresh than just like we have to look at how we deal with emergency services as a whole instead of just focusing on the police because how do we change this to be a better service for the people yeah another quick thing i wanted to call out is that on this sign number two it says funding black communities a story that just came out um five days ago actually was that seattle has launched in something called an equitable communities initiative task force to guide a a bipoc investment uh it says that they are going to invest 100 million dollars in black indigenous and communities of color This investment helps address deep disparities caused by systemic racism and institutional oppression. I think that the idea is if you get enough people on board on the task force that um, should be the people we're listening to, that hopefully the money gets placed (laughs) in in the the right right places. places. Um, I recently just interviewed... um, somebody who had a lot of experience with homelessness and he's Mm -hmm. on a task force and he's working with Durkin as well. And I, I do think that that's one thing that I can say positive about her is like the more that you can bring people that are affected directly into your task force to help allocate the resources and make those decisions. I think the better decision you'll hopefully make. So, I mean, I think that's a good thing in theory, right? It's not a super radical idea to listen to the people that are telling you what the problem is. Um, But (laughs) at the same time, like that person doesn't necessarily have the answer. Uh And so like, that's, that's kind of the thing with, with, with like, this is going to be a discovery process. It's going to take years of like figuring out like, Hey, what is the disparity? Like even figuring out what the disparity is, is it the number of libraries available to like those, all those little tiny things end up feeding into this. Like, but at the same time, you don't want like a, an older white lady to make the decision for all like a black community, yeah. how to allocate the resources. Well, like, exactly. It's, part of it's the optics. And part of it is like you want buy-in from the community. Well, and that, that's my whole point here is that you could be cynical about it no matter which. You can be a cynic about anything. And, and in this particular instance, I'm willing to say that it is not cynical to say that like, yeah, you could be like, oh, yeah, she's just some white lady reaching out and, and trying to get involvement with her community for political reasons. Like you can always, always say that. But like that doesn't change the fact that she's doing something about it. And like when we when you change the fact that like somebody's doing something about something, you just have to kind of let it go. Like whether or not you you think it's genuine, yeah. something is getting done. And I'd like to see that actually grow into something that is meaningful and is worth, you know, the amount of um, effort that th- people are putting into it. Mm-hmm. Because law enforcement is not crime prevention. And crime prevention is not law enforcement. Those are two completely separate ideas that support each other. But they are not going to happen independent of each other. We're not ever going to be able to completely abolish the police. But we are going to be able, at we least if we want to live re-imagine in society, Reimagine it. We can severely <laughs> reimagine it. Yeah. Okay. We can queer eye the fuck out of it and <laughs> get it at French tuck. Okay. Oh my 
god. Get it to like learn its, you know, button down, you know, a little color pre preparing, you know, uh-huh. pre match everything. I don't know. And you could go down down the down the rabbit hole of like how do you get these people to, we, we have to reimagine this. Yes. We have to fix this because this is not working. Yes. And if we don't know that it's not working, then you're not paying attention. <laughs> Slate, thank you for being on the show. Um I appreciate you taking the time. If uh, yeah. people out there want to get in contact you yeah, if you'd for like more to, information. Um, if, feel free to contact me if you'd like to threaten me, uh, threaten my life. Uh, go ahead, uh, contact me below. Uh, slate, <laughs> if you want to threaten my life, you're gonna contact me my life, <laughs> Contact me directly about it because I'd rather be able to read it myself than have you just kind of scream it to the world. You know, If you're going to do it, make it personal. Right, maybe write me a death card. That'd be nice. Is there any, uh, is there, <laughs> I'll let you have the final word. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we end you this? You know, other than that, honestly, this just proved to me just how not ready we are for a second, for a second civil war. And like, if nothing else, even if you don't agree with the people that are in front of you, you have to find a common love for each other because whether or not we agree on what we should do, we are still in this together. And whether or not you like it, our histories are irrevocably tied to each other. And we have to be able to figure out how to manage this as a whole. And it's so much bigger than just one person. So vote your way, do your thing, do whatever you can. But as a personal challenge, people need to take it upon themselves to do something about this. No one else is going to fix this for us. So that's going to be my bit, I suppose. All right. Uh, Thanks, guys, for listening. Bye. <laughs> Stupid, I should take that off. <laughs> uh, you got this. This is an outro. There you go.